So you have a horse, uh, he's uh, two to one. He's going to pay $6.40, right? You're going to bet $40 into the race, but all of it is contingent on this horse winning. You're going to bet exactly as you're going to bet tries trying to make a score. All right, so you whiff on all of that, and meanwhile, you could have had 40 to win on the horse and got back $128 for your 40. You would have been up $80, $84, right? Or $88. Uh, but why would you do that when you could fuck it up? That's what we do. <laughs> And then show the guy your losing ticket with your bad breath. Uh, you know, you just had a salami sandwich and, uh, you know, something that was laced with garlic. And you get right in the guy's face and go, whoa, look at that. He left out the two. <laughs> like anybody wants to hear about your sorry losing ways, especially in those circumstances, because they're losing too. If you're, you know, happen to know the guy's winning, maybe he throws you a couple of bucks and says, uh, you know, here, the chorus, get out of my face here. You're whining and you're fetching. Unbelievable. No, nothing worse than a guy. Sh I, is there anything worse in a gambling situation than a guy showing you his losing ticket at the track? Oh, yeah, that's the worst. And they all, and you all do it. Awesome. Bitch. Everybody, right? Oh, look, look at that. I left I out the two. Well, well, you're an asshole. That's why you left out the two. <laughs> you lost. Just a minute. <laughs> You're a lousy handicapper, a poor money manager, and you really have no business being here in the first place. And guess what? You haven't had a winning year in your life. But there we are. <laughs> Every day. The time. Wake up with Defo. Joined by Luby. Welcome to the Defo Show. All right, all right, all right. Hey, good morning, everybody. On Appeal Yourself Off the Mat Monday. Great to be with you, Jeff DeForest and Mike Luby Lubitz, the Depot Show here on South Florida Live. And we will be with you uh, live until 9 o'clock. And, of course, you can catch the thing all day long. A lot of people catching on. A lot of people ask me about the channel now. Uh, you know, I guess we've been away from terrestrial radio long enough that people you know, are starting to ask the uh, magic question is, uh, uh, what happened to you? Where are you? Where are you working these days? But uh, we have this whole thing going, and uh, it's starting to catch on a little bit, so uh, we're happy about that. Uh, special shout-out. I hope my man's listening early in the morning. So I ran into this gentleman. Uh, he may be – I mean, it's hard to say this because we have a lot of really great fans and uh, terrific fans, but uh, a gentleman named Pete may be our biggest fan. Luby. Loves you, Hi. loves the show, and uh, I sent him the link a while back through Marty the Party Sacks, and uh, he, he was the one client that came on board when we were doing a couple of shout-outs for – Marty Sachs's business, fine line printing. Oh, yeah, that guy's great. But if we're not going to bring you quantity, uh, all of you sponsors out there, <laughs> what we do is we bring you quality. So yes. this guy became a big client of Marty the Party Sachs. So he, he could have had 100 inquiries from people. Now, how much is it to print the menu? Oh, really? By the word you charge, Marty? Uh, he could have had any number of people like that call him. Uh, very annoying, right? I mean, because uh, it's like, I mean, you know, get a bunch of uh, small checks in and uh, they all add up to the same amount of money that maybe you were owed anyway. But uh, who wants to get this money in very small chunks? It's tough. You know, you got to send out 100 bills. So it it's great to get one uh, giant colossal client out of the thing. And that's what happened with Marty to Party Sacks. And this gentleman, Pete, who, who is a real gentleman. I mean, he great. actually offered. How about this? I was. He asked me what happened to Jersey Kyle on the show because he's a big Jersey Kyle fan. He was a fan of everybody that was involved with the program, which is always nice to see. And uh, I told him, you know what? Uh, at the moment of truth there, we were begging Jersey Kyle to buy a computer. He didn't do it. So what are we going to do? I mean, how much can you hock a guy, you know, and keep pounding a guy? Hey, hey, could you do this? Could you do this? Could you do this? And after a while, you just say, okay, the guy doesn't want to do it. I mean, you know, so it's okay. No hard feelings, nothing. He's still a great guy, whatever. But uh, he even offered yesterday when I told him that story. To buy Kyle a computer so he'd become <laughs> part of the show. Now, that's a fan. That's great, man. I said, it's no, no, Kyle has plenty of money. It's not like, uh, you know, he can't afford it. He just didn't. <laughs> <Being an asshole. laughs> Whether he's lame, I, I don't know. But whatever the reason was, I, I, I don't question people anymore. It's 71. You stop questioning people. You just say, hey, you do your thing. It's fine. I have no beef, whatever. Just go and do it. And, uh, you know, I, I, you can't force anybody to – you can't make anybody happy. That That's, I guess, the way it is. Not that it applies in this case because the guy was a happy guy anyway and probably doesn't miss doing a thing. So uh, whatever. It's a wash. It all works out. But he offered to buy him a computer. That, that was his first reaction was, uh, well, I'll buy him one. And we're like, well, we probably could have bought him one too at the yeah, time. But uh, have laptops. It's, that's not the issue. It's, it's the drive. It is what it right. Is. If you really don't want to do it, then then why why, why go half ass? It's like an athlete that's only half in, right? 
Yep. A lot of coaches yep. would say that. Hey, uh, you know what? If you really don't want to play like, like this guy, uh, Robbie Anderson yesterday, yeah, if you really don't want to play, if you're going to be like that, then get the, uh, get the bleep out of yeah. here. Yep. Sayonara. All right. I, I would have to say this uh, and happy birthday. The reason for the birthday Thanks. music, it, Luby celebrated his 40th birthday yesterday. And as part of the ongoing celebration, th there will be a party of sorts. Although I don't know <laughs> that you would call this a party. Maya thinks it's going to be a party. I'm like, I don't think you understand how our things work. <laughs> what kind of party are we going to arrange overnight? Right? Yes, I made a, <laughs> I happened to run into a guy yesterday that could set us up at the Bamboo Beach. He had a great Sean McNamara, and we called yes. Frankie Tallarico. He said, yeah, sure, I'd love to do that. And so, and, and I don't even think he understands that it's only like three, four people that are showing up to this thing. Yeah, it's I mean, you, me, it's Mayo, and uh, maybe, you know, one other. I mean, uh, women have been following Mayo to these various locations. You never know which one's going to show up or if somebody new is going to surface because uh, Mayo has some kind of bizarre animal magnetism. And <laughs> I do believe this about women, that, that women believe that they can fix you. Oh, they yeah. Can't. Oh, yeah. They that think, you know something. what, if you're just having to be sort of, I mean... I don't know. See, Mayo's not really a down guy. I, I think he's enjoying himself, but but he comes off as if like everything sucks. Yes, doesn't he? Yeah. Yes, yes, like, yes. Oh, I had to go to the doctor today, <laughs> and he told me I was sick. It's like, Mike, you're fine. <laughs> you you want to shake him up? Like, like I I keep talking about that scene in The Godfather where where the uh, Sinatra character comes in. And he goes, "You're a man. Quit crying like a baby. <laughs> Act like a man." <laughs> you know, because the guy got fucked and he wasn't going to be able to get into that film. <laughs> Anyway, I, I believe that might be part of the attraction. Not that Mike's not a good-looking guy, but we'll be out there uh, later on today. Bamboo Beach Club behind the Ocean Manor Hotel. One of our favorite spots. I think it's appropriate, Louie, that it worked out that way because the options were starting to dwindle down, and it was either going to be Stingers or the Bamboo Beach. And uh, Stingers was willing to host us there, and uh, that was also a fabled spot. I ended up meeting a Mustang at Stingers. You did. You did. And uh, you had many, many, I mean, it just amazing incidents. Involving the opposite sex. Uh, well, we were doing shows at the Ocean Manor Hotel. I, I, I would have to say this. Uh, you know, we had some of the most fun we've ever had doing any kind of broadcast. We were broadcasting literally to the wind at that point. We were on, <laughs> on a station at night. They couldn't be heard outside the parking lot. I don't even know if you could hear it in the parking lot. I had that happen to me a long time when I first started doing radio broadcasts. I was uh, broadcasting uh, high school baseball games. And we were doing them on a tape delay basis on a station called KREL in Corona, California. And literally, I, I left the parking lot. And, and this was, uh, you know, I mean, within one mile of proximity of the tower. The tower was like right there uh, on the property. And uh, you couldn't hear the broadcast. That was it. <laughs> That's kind of how this uh, station was. Although uh, we went back there, but they were enhanced greatly yes. by FM signals. Oh, and so... The landscape had changed to the point where it was, uh, I don't know that it was favorable, but uh, it was more favorable to broadcast at night there than it had been in the past. Because uh, we had that problem with uh, Alex Sufreen, remember? When I took Sufreen out and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, the show comes in loud and clear everywhere. And then I got in my car and it was fuzzy. And I was like, ah, <laughs> shit, somebody broke my antenna. <laughs> and I realized there is no antenna. This isn't like that 64 Mustang I had where you said, put the antenna. Anyway, there'll be a birthday celebration later on today of okay. sorts. It's a birthday celebration show, see? So the show itself is the celebration. I don't know that we're having any wild party there. And Mayo thinks they're going to be like strippers and all kinds of stuff. Or what is he expecting out there? He, pr he, he promoted like it's going to be some big thing. I'm like, I don't. it's fine, man. <laughs> Let's do a show. <laughs> yeah, we're showing up. We're going to, you know, eat the free food, uh, try and uh, do our usual good job of promoting the place That's because fine. it's a place that we happen to have a great affinity for. And it is a great place to go. I mean, I if you're looking place. for a place, people are always asking on that. Let's eat South Florida. Hey, where's a great place to go have lunch on the beach? This is it. Yes, right? on the beach. On the beach. I like that. I mean, literally, the ocean is steps away. It's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, they really do a great job there. So looking forward to being out there later on. And uh, Luby, uh, hopefully they'll remember that I set this up yesterday. Because, uh, <laughs> Sean Mack might have been slightly inebriated at the time. You talk about double barrel degeneracy. That's what was going on yesterday. We went over to Stingers to uh, watch uh, the Dolphins game, which is not a high priority at, at this particular place, even though it's right here in town, right up the street from my place. And uh, yeah, but they're, uh, you know, infatuated with the Detroit Lions who weren't Lions. playing yesterday. I guess they had a bye. 
uh, yeah. this week. And uh, secondary to uh, when, when Sean Mack was involved, he was a Patriot fan until they lost Brady. I don't think he's as big of a Patriot fan, but he did have money on the Patriots yesterday. That was a gimme as they were in control the entire time. You were getting points, and uh, it seemed like it was a lock situation you couldn't lose. And uh, the Cleveland coach, who's coaching Cleveland? Uh, there's got to be some rookie, right? Coaching the Cleveland Browns this year. Stefanski. I think the Stefanski guy is still coaching the Browns. Oh, okay. I mean, you're down like you know, 20 points. What are you doing going for a field goal with six minutes to go in a ball game? At that point, uh, is it not a losing proposition to kick a field goal? You're, you're not even trying, attempting to look like you're competing there. I mean, that's just a waste. I don't care what the situation is. You need three touchdowns, six minutes to go in a game. Kicking a field goal uh, with the math uh, not in your favor uh, to get three points it doesn't do anything to change the dynamic of the score. Uh, it was pathetic, right? And they kicked a field goal. They were down, I think, I don't know, like 25-12. They kick a field goal to make it 25-15. Oh, well, I guess that would have made sense. It was even it was an even wider margin than that. Yeah, I think that's what, yeah. Anyway, uh, Sean Mack, so he has the under in the Dolphin game. And so he's watching that. That looked like a lock from very early on, although yeah. uh, I think they came close to the total in the end. Total sure. might have been, was it 45 or 42? Whatever it was. 45, they only landed 45. On 45. Okay. 45. So I wasn't really threatened, but uh, you know, and every every NFL game gets dicey at, at the yeah, very the end. Does it not? One, if either team scored one more time, you're over. It's over. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fluke game. touchdown, right? <laughs> what can ruin me? A pick six. Exactly. There are two mean? two factions working here. What can ruin me? A pick six, and what can save me? A pick six. <laughs> you're rooting for a pick six with like three seconds to go, and you're hoping a guy takes it all the way into the end zone. This new business of dropping to the ground there because the game is won. I'm not in favor of it. I, I think runners that drop to the ground and don't score when they easily could have should be fined and or banned from the league. Did you have, did you, Especially, what, did you have the Giants in a certain amount of points? <laughs> Why are you upset about that? <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I've been doing OK. Uh, my buddy Francesco, whose bets I've been booking for years and I've talked about him many times, went on a, a two 13 and one streak encompassing a Sunday of uh, pro football where he went 0-7 and no, he finally went one and seven, yeah. one, seven and one. That was last week. Yep. And uh, then he proceeded to go one and six in college football, oh, no. including. <laughs> and, and I wanted I wanted to get to this because I, I, I've been watching sports my whole life, uh, just like Jim Sarney, just like a lot of our fans out there, a lot of our viewers, a lot of our listeners. Uh, obviously, you're big sports fans or you wouldn't be tuned in at seven in the morning to two schmucks that are doing a video stream. <laughs> whether you liked this before or not i mean uh, still if you just discovered this thing and you're wondering what the hell is that man and, and where is luby broadcasting from <laughs> and when is the baby due with shirley when <laughs> is the baby due you've had this crib back there for a year i don't see any kid in there is there a kid under those covers oh they're good and pull them right <laughs> off there <laughs> it's time to make some changes that's what i've been thinking <laughs> anyway um it, uh, it started out for me uh, on uh, Friday night, this wild weekend, because uh, I get a text late and then I've got two college games now that I have to take a look at. And I would have no interest in these games other than the fact that I had booked action on these games uh, with my buddy Francesco. Right. So I have Navy getting 12 and a half against SMU. W would you ever consider watching even a fraction of a second of that game? Answer. No, I think Navy. I have great respect for our military and our armed forces and the job they do and the brave people that uh, are part of it and, and uh, protecting our freedoms and all of that stuff. I, mad respect for these people and the uh, institution itself. As far as the football team goes, it has sucked since uh, the very beginning of time. I, I don't care. You could talk about Heisman Trophy winners and, uh, you know, going back in the day in the Army-Navy game. I, you know, all of that tradition is fantastic. Navy, to watch Navy play that triple option, a, any team that's running the triple option these days should also be banned from any level of football, including Pop Warner. <laughs> Throw the fucking ball. <laughs> Drop back like a man. Be a man. You got to shake him like Mayo. Be a man. Quit whining. Drop back. Throw the ball, and, and, and let's uh, base the offense on the fact that you might hit a long play or, uh, you know, you're going to be in action passing the ball. Your wide receivers are going to be dangerous. Uh, never mind this uh, Joe Bellino or whatever his name is. What is it? Bellini? Bellino? The guy uh, was their famous uh, running back. Uh, you know, uh, running the triple option. I mean, well, what are we talking about, Barry Switzer breath? Get rid of this. It should, it should be a banned strategy, just like the uh, shift in baseball is going to be banned, which is ridiculous. This should be banned. 
which I, I guess now that I'm saying it probably <laughs> seems equally ridiculous to you that I'm saying it. I, I don't know. It's just been boring. I Do you enjoy, enjoy watching Navy play football? There's never a time I go, whoa, man, I can't wait to see Navy play today. No, no. I don't even think Ron DeSantis watches Navy. <laughs> that's his big thing is that he was Mr. in the freaking Navy. Navy. Yeah. Mr. Navy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I tune into this game, and uh, I mean, I understand why, uh, you know, degenerate gamblers uh, keep a cap of cyanide by the bed, because uh, this would have been torture if I was on the other side of this thing. Uh, Navy scores with 12 seconds to go, a meaningless backdoor cover touchdown, and so somehow I get within the 12 and a half. So I win that one, and guess uh, the other game, now I never would have watched a second of this. Uh, although we did have an interest in this uh, school at one time since they're here in town and Butch Davis was coaching there and we became friends with Ron FIU. Turner, FIU, FIU is getting 34, oh my God. 34 points at home against the university of Texas, San Antonio, which uh, I don't know that we've ever verified this, but we have speculated for years is an it online good. school. It's, <laughs> I don't know if it's online. Do they have Coach a campus? Yes. Coker coach there. I don't think the fighting Coker, I don't think Coker still coaches there, but. Coker at one point. Coker's long gone. No, Coker's yeah. long gone from that school. Uh, anyway, they've been somewhat successful, believe it or not. Yes. I mean, by whatever standard you're judging their success by, it's not like they're competing for a national championship. But uh, overall, I mean, uh, I want to say that the results for the University of Texas San Antonio have been somewhat favorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, 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 you know, proverbial patsy once in a while. They go in there and get schlacked by Michigan. But uh, in, in their own level of competition, and on their own level of competition, they do just fine. In fact, uh, they're one of the uh, better teams. So favored by 34 on the road against FIU. And, uh, I mean, so what are you immediately thinking? Please, FIU, get the ball and hold it for about six minutes <laughs> and score some points. And they almost do it. They hold the ball for six minutes, miss a field goal. But they stayed in the game the entire time, ended up losing, I believe, the final was 30 to 10. Yeah, and you, got, you had a nice, easy cover there, actually. Oh, my God. Can you believe this? I mean, what a way to start the weekend. Oh, my God. But there was such yeah. a saturation of high-level sports at, at uh, you know, I mean, you know, the most meaningful uh, of levels also, as you had all of this playoff baseball going on on Friday. And uh, then that, that morphed into a Saturday, although you had a bunch of uh, clinchers there in a couple of games in the series. But uh, you still had a lot of drama. Uh, Dodgers being eliminated over the weekend by the San Diego Padres. I mean, and now people are fetching saying that uh, this new playoff format is unfair to the really good teams. <laughs> that the best of five after having like a week off uh, finds them coming into these situations ice cold and oh. is compromising the chances of the very best teams because the other teams have at least gotten into a postseason rhythm. Yeah, Harvey and, was lamenting that be and the Yankees ended up winning, but he was lumping the Yankees in with the Dodgers. Um, saying and the Braves also great. ended up losing. It's not fair. I'm like, not fair. I'm, I'm Braves sure. had a sensational uh, year in, in mowing down, uh, and they came on late and, and ended up mowing down the uh, New York Mets. Uh, Mets uh, were crying that they had to be in that first series. They lost it to Philadelphia, who all of a sudden has gotten hot. And um, and, and now here, here you go. You have uh, Philadelphia uh, going uh, in, in against the San Diego. Oh, they lost to the Padres, the Mets. Uh, the Padres, uh, you know, and, and the Padres are a representative team. I mean, uh, they have a decent uh, core of starting pitchers and, and some excellent players, right? I mean, and considering they're missing Fernando Tatis, uh, they still draw a lot of stars and heavyweight hitters out there. So, uh, you know, it's not inconceivable to see the Padres uh, winning a best of three playoff series. Uh, that, that wasn't far fetched. Uh, you know, were, were, were the Braves compromised by. Uh, you know, not being able to play in the Dodgers, the same thing. Dodgers ended up losing in uh, four games to the San Diego Padres. And uh, the Braves uh, got knocked out, what, in four also the by the Phillies. Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, Is there Phillies. something to that? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, the Yankees were division winners. And uh, th this was the great thing about Yankee fans over the weekend. They all were resigned to the fact that the season was a complete waste, that Cashman had to go, that Aaron Boone, which uh, this is a fairly common theme, that Aaron Boone is the worst game day manager in the history of managers and or coaches, that, that he may be the absolute <laughs> worst. Now, that's saying a lot. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> and you look at some of the things, I mean, you know, some of the things that are disturbing about the, I mean, probably the most obvious is that nobody runs to first base on the Yankees. Yes. Yeah, so they hit the ball and they stand there at home playing and go, hey, hey look at me. <laughs> 
and like they were rerun coming in. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> and uh, you're like, well, what are you doing at home? Play with a bat in your hand. The ball's in play, for God's sake. And, uh, you know, we've seen any number of uh, atrocities take place on the base pass because and Yankees getting thrown out and uh, running, you know, literally not running singles in, you know, what would be triples into singles uh, and getting thrown out at first base trying to go back. I mean, just crazy stuff. So uh, some of that probably is on Aaron Boone, right? He should bench a guy for doing that. The minute a guy's loaf, I remember Gil Hodges going out to left field there and pulling Cleon Jones out of the game, guys. Huh? I mean, he walked out to left field. Cleon Jones was an outstanding player for the Mets, one of the most valuable players that they had on that team. And uh, because he wasn't hustling on one play, uh, Hodges, Gil Hodges, may he rest in peace, walked straight out to left field and yanks the guy. Doesn't care about the embarrassment. You were more of an embarrassment, not hustling. So, um, I mean, that would be a criticism. Uh, I guess this uh, Kiner Falefa, the shortstop, uh, you know, has uh, – uh, is like Dr. Strangelove out there, and, and people were wondering why he, he was out there starting at shortstop and butchering games. But but the Yankee fans, after going down 2-1 to the Cleveland Indians, who re- really have struggled to score runs. So you, you would have to think the Yankees are in there with more than a shot with Garrett Cole going in, Cole going in uh, game four to come back and win the series. They, they're now going to host game five tonight uh, at home. Uh, they have a favorable pitching matchup. They have a much better guy going than the Cleveland Indians, uh, Guardians do. Guardians. And uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, probably go on and win the series. What would you think, Luby? I mean, it's all the stage is all set, and especially so because every Yankee fan had thrown in the towel after they went down 2-1. You ever seen a bunch of more entitled fetchers or whiners oh my God, than Yankee fans? My God. I mean, like like they're supposed to win every game. They're, they're, not, you know. they're not that great when, when you look at the lineup. Sure, they have Aaron Judge, but he was at one point in the series uh, 0 for 9 with eight strikeouts. And batting leadoff for most of the series. I, I guess they finally moved him back to the second position. But why, why do you have a guy that hit 62 home runs batting leadoff? Leadoff. That's the, the stupid analytics where he, he gets an extra. But bat him third. Bat him third. That's fine, right? That, that was the big thing about uh, Jimmy Leland and Barry Bonds. Like, why would you hit Barry Bonds fourth when you could bat him third and you have any number of sluggers that, that could fill the fourth hole? But you would want this guy to get up in the first inning and have a chance to uh, maybe get five at bats in a game, whereas uh, batting fourth, he might have only been to the plate four times. And if they're going to walk him three of those four times, he's getting one stinking at bat. But but why would you bat the guy lead? A guy with sixty two home runs should not be batting leadoff. I, I don't care under any circumstances, Louie. That, that, that's just absolutely insane. It defies every credo of baseball logic that you could possibly apply, except for as you said, maybe he gets more at bats, but. Uh, don't you want this guy hitting it out of the park with two men on base uh, as opposed uh, and, and put even more pressure on pitchers to pitch to him instead of just, uh, you know, pitching around a guy. So what if you put judge on first base to start the game? You got a bunch of schleps coming up to the plate after that schleps. Oh, they're not schleps, but uh, anyway, so that's on the line tonight. And, uh, I don't know. I, now I have to, I, I'm sorry, but with the whining and the fetching that went on from the various Yankee fans, I, I'm rooting for him to lose. I really am. Nice. <laughs> Grew up a Yankee fan, uh, you know, defected to the uh, Mets, uh, you know, and I never, there was never a time where I hated the Yankees like a lot of people do. Still, uh, you know, uh, the New York roots uh, say, hey, any New York team, I'm probably rooting for them a little bit. But um, and so the baseball was great. That, that was all part of the weekend. And then, I mean, we haven't even mentioned it yet, huh? The two words that really, I mean, uh, did they steal the show over the weekend? College football. Oh, yeah. Over the weekend was uh, sensational including the Tennessee-Alabama game where Nick went down. And, and what is more enjoyable, people, than seeing Nick go apeshit on the sidelines yelling at some kid after he had been on, uh, you know, any number of interviews where he tries to act like a human being and says, well, <laughs> it's all about the kids. And then he Woody Hayes, this guy. I mean, uh, it was insane. I mean, he stopped just short of Bobby Knight and the kid and uh, strangling him, uh, you know, right there on the sidelines in the middle of a game. All that being said, now – People always made this equation, right, that penalties fall upon the responsibility of coaches, mm-hmm. that it's not players that commit penalties, but if you have an inordinate number of penalties, an absurd number of penalties in a game, that it falls on the idea that maybe you're not coaching well. So then how would you ever justify Nick Saban's team getting penalized 17 times in a game against Tennessee? 17 times. That's crazy. Nick, what's going on there? Where's the discipline, Nicky boy? And they're still in it. They still could have easily won that game. That That's the incredible thing. I mean, how, how hard is it to kill the beast? They had two games already this year where it looked like they were going to lose. 
and uh, had, had an excellent uh, chance to go down. I mean, it, it could easily be an Alabama team with three losses this year. Honestly. But uh, finally, Tennessee came through, and uh, a lot of our handicappers like Tennessee in a game, although these things tend to balance out, Luby, because everybody loved Penn State yeah, and the parlay, over Michigan. The Ken parlay that we almost went in on that I held back from did not occur. <laughs> Here's what struck me as I was watching Michigan destroy Penn State, okay? What, what was the theory about Michigan? I mean, we were even on our good friend Ed Garcia Anyone. of Texas Roadhouse Restaurants about this. I, I wouldn't do this because uh, as one of our uh, key sponsors on this enterprise, uh, far be it from me to take a shot that he might become offended at our remarks that Michigan has played nothing but Patsy's Cupcakes <laughs> and Little Sisters of the Poor so far. Now, in essence, that's true. It's true. It isn't like their schedule was, uh, you know, a uh, uh, six pack of world beaters going into this ball game, or what? They had they were they five and zero or six and zero? I guess they were five and zero. I think they were five and zero. Five and zero, six and zero, whatever it is. They they were undefeated. They played a bunch of teams that that really, uh, you know, weren't that significant this year. weren't going anywhere, uh, including an extremely weak out of conference schedule that they had put together under uh, Jim Harbaugh. So uh, here's the thing, though, uh, and, and this is where this theory is flawed, where you say, well. Let's see what they do when they play a real team. Okay, so it would be like, I mean, the example I used when I was talking to somebody about this on Saturday, uh, you'll find it surprising. I was at a parimutuel facility punching away. Uh, and, uh, okay, let's say Roger Federer goes through the first three rounds of a tournament. And he plays a qualifier, the number 252 guy in a year, and uh, then some guy that uh, is coming out of uh, two years of a layoff and, and managed to make his way into the third round. And, uh, you know, so you're saying, okay, well, geez, uh, Roger Federer, he hasn't played anybody. The problem is he's Roger Federer, and he is really good. (laughs) And when he does play somebody good, like Djokovic, he's going to destroy him too. And that's what happened with Michigan. Uh, They just destroyed Penn State in that ballgame in the second half uh, after, uh, what was it, 16-14 halftime. And it looked like our handicappers might have been on to something. But every wise guy, every handicapper, and these are guys we have great respect for, that we talked to said, take the seven points with Penn State. Michigan hasn't played anybody. Well, they still haven't played anybody because they shellacked Penn State, <laughs> who looked like an even bigger phony than you could have ever imagined Michigan to be. So uh, that that was a great, uh, great, great ball game uh, that took place on uh, Saturday. Uh, the college football was insane, right? Clemson and uh, Florida State, I, I mean, it was a domination for most of the game. The final score Dicey, right? I, I think I was getting uh, f- giving five with Clemson in that game. He covered. I mean, Florida yeah. State interesting at the end. They, they just had a horrendous end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter, and it took them again that fourth quarter to, to storm back. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I was surprised when I saw because it was like 34-14 when I figured yes. that game was a lock, yes. and I was in good shape. Uh, USC ended up covering. I was getting three and a hook there. And uh, they lost the ball game to Utah. That that was a wild one, also. Wow, we'll talk about a back and forth shootout. Very much like the Alabama game uh, against uh, Tennessee. Th- those were two really, really good ball games. And then how about this? How about if you had Stanford on the money line against Notre Dame, Ew. getting sixteen and a half points, sixteen and a hook, Louie. And uh, they win the game outright. Wow. I mean, uh, that was uh, that was a stunner as well. Uh, University of Miami hung on. They, they started out red hot against Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech, not very good. Oh. And Mario Cristobal, uh, they hung on by the skin of their teeth there and uh, won that ball game 20 to 14. So all of a sudden, Canes fans are back on a bandwagon. Talk about fair weather fans. Right? They, they were ready to run this guy out of town just a week ago. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, you see that? Mario's got it going in the right direction. I uh, don't know that that would uh, be a distinguishing point to uh, eke out a victory on the road against Virginia Tech, a team that uh, really didn't. I mean, I, I don't know when was uh, they're, they're up and down uh, at this stage. I guess that uh, they sometimes have representative teams, but the uh, Frank Beamer era seems to be a thing of the past. No, uh, are they ever going to be you know like a, a heavyweight force where you're like, well, uh-huh. we don't want to play Virginia Tech. I'm not sure about that. And uh, guess who's undefeated, Luby? The Syracuse Orange. Oh, yeah, undefeated. your Chiefs. Yeah, your Chiefs should yeah. be top 10. I was impressive. I mean, they just keep going. They beat NC State. Uh, they hadn't really. That was another team where the argument was, well, who have they played? Really nobody. Uh, and and yet they went out there and managed to uh, win uh, very convincingly against uh, North Carolina State, a team that uh, people have a lot I, of respect for. They, they were toe-to-toe against Clemson the week before. Could have uh, possibly pulled that game out, but uh, didn't. And uh, then went on the road against Syracuse and lost that game. So the Cuse, 
uh, yeah. like six and zero oh on the season, which uh, I find remarkable. Legit. All right, we're going to uh, talk a lot of uh, National Football League today uh, with Bert Tester, the agent of the stars. He's going to join us here in just a couple sure. of minutes. Uh, this Bailey Zappi, is that how you pronounce it? Zappi or is it Zappi? That is how they pronounce it. It's Bailey Zappi. Wow, does he zap Mac Jones right out of the starting job? Their oh, offense is oh, significantly is? better with Bailey Zappi uh, in the ball game. They weren't really doing much with Mac six. Jones. I haven't watched anything with the Patriots, and I assume Bailey Zappi was a joke. So that's interesting. No, they, they were they were solid yesterday. No, the Zappi man uh, threw for three hundred plus and uh, re really looked. Uh, he, he looks the part uh, for sure. Uh, the uh, Cooper Rush thing uh, might have come back down to earth, uh, although uh, they were briefly making a, a comeback in that game against the Eagles. How about this? Uh, the guy misses a 59-yard field goal by an inch, and, and the significance there was uh, that was a differential in the point spread. Philadelphia was laying six and a half in the game. If uh, this goes through the uprights with like a minute to go, it's unlikely Philadelphia does anything with the ball except sit on it. And so you end up covering the point spread, uh, even though Philadelphia had dominated that game early and remains the only undefeated team in the National Football League. Uh, how about, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Bittner or something? I don't know. Some, uh, Buckner? It's like Bill Buckner, the kicker for Kansas City. Kicked a 62-yarder into the Butker. win. Butker. Butker, Butker, yeah. Wow, that was something, huh? I mean, we're seeing a lot of heroics uh, by kickers uh, and, uh, you know, and near misses as well. But uh, that was really something. How about, too, I mean, uh, the uh, Alabama kickers uh, attempt uh, with, with, what, less than a minute to go? Uh, what was a thing of beauty. I mean, from style point standpoint, it was uh, absolutely great, except it went, uh, you know, like an inch wide to the right. And then uh, the Tennessee kicker uh, literally muffs this kick. Yeah, it was horrible. I mean, it's a knuckleball going sideways. I just missed it. And they're like, it went in. I'm like, went in. <laughs> <laughs> right through. No problem. <laughs> Carry him off the field. He's a hero. All right, uh, we're going to come back with Brett Tester, the agent of the stars, John Kajemi with the uh, Pigskin Playbook, uh, formerly known as uh, Dateline Dolphins. Uh, John Kajemi going to join us. That's brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. Hylia Park, one of the great places to go. Uh, jackpots galore being taken down over the weekend. I did all the survey. I was at another paramutual facility much closer to the uh, default household uh, over the, oh, well, I guess it was Saturday. Uh, Mustang under the ruse of, well, I have free play. Yeah, okay, so that cost me 200 but I managed to uh, bail out with... <laughs> Probably, I mean, if you think Biden is messing up the economics of the United States of America, nobody could have displayed worse money management than I did at the track on Saturday. Now, money management isn't necessarily my game because I'm a screen-to-screen -screen player. So the only money you're trying to manage is what you have left in your bankroll. It's not like you're, uh, you know, making wise decisions and thinking, okay, well, if I allot this much of a percentage of my bankroll of this, I'll get back a return on investment of uh, $3 for every two. I mean, you know, I don't think like that when I'm at the track. I'm not like, like all of you uh, people out there that are degenerate gamblers. I'm fueled by self-sabotage and determined to find a way to lose. Separate <laughs> me from my money, even if I'm having a great day. But if I had any balls, I, I, I would have walked out of there with a lot of money on uh, Saturday because I, I, I was picking good horses. So I, I managed to, to salvage the day. But, but I did a little survey with the Mustang after. And I said, look, I, I want to compare this to Hialeah Park, the casino there. Because when you walk around there, everybody's festive. And I said, look, woman over there, totally depressed. Woman over there, completely <laughs> out of her mind. This one, sad face. Looks like she just found out that her best friend had died. <laughs> Every machine was occupied by somebody with a sour freaking puss. Um, that is a test of a casino. Now, if you see, uh, you know, the vibe in there is like a morgue and, uh, you know, you're, you're looking, uh, where, where do I get the embalming fluid? Is that on the house? <laughs> yeah, I have a VIP card. Right. And they give you a high quality embalming fluid. So you don't like have the twitches. You just pass out right away. <laughs> Eileen, I don't need to mess with that, man. They're serving you another cocktail at a reasonable price because everybody's happy there because you're in there with a shot to win. Yeah. And that's what it's all about at, at Hylia Park. They want you to have a good time. They really do a great job. Tremendous. Champion Simon Casting Room, uh, absolutely ideal. Uh, the best place to uh, bet the ponies. And, and and when you're in Champions, they have the games on and stuff like that. You, you don't have to go, hey, can, can you get the Dolphin game? And then, you know, you're talking to somebody now in a case where we go at uh, – the local paramutual facility, the, the people that work the bar, are very good about not, you know, giving you a face when you ask for a channel change on the TV. You get that mayo face, right? When you suggest, uh, hey, hey, Mike, why don't we go to a place that uh, I've been to many times? I think it's great. And he gives you that face. Yeah, what do you know? <laughs> 
I don't know anything. I've been dining out here for 40 years. I mean, I've <laughs> eaten in a wide variety of places. I have a pretty good judge, uh, you know, of uh, what I like and what I don't like. May not be the same things. But, uh, you know, you know, you get that. Like at Land Lovers, you, you, you know, you would never get that. But other sports yeah. bars, uh, you know, you, you want them to change from CNN to the World Series. And <laughs> the guy looks at you like, well, I don't have time for that. Exactly. Don't have time for that. Right, yeah, and they end up in a, a mood where you want to throw a drink in his face when it finally comes. Uh, and uh, you know, not that I recommend violence. I don't want to be like Trump. Why don't you just go out there and punch a guy in the face? That was his first recommendation. Then it escalated to, why don't we just crack the windows out of the Capitol building and go in there and kill Mike Pence? But no big deal. Elections are right around the corner here. I, I would imagine that wisdom and that philosophy will end up prevailing. That would be interesting. Well, anyway. All right, so Hylia Park is a place to go. If you want to have a good time, get a player's card when you come through the door. All kind, I mean, just a tremendous reward system yep. they have there. I mean, for, for an individual casino like this to have a reward system of that level of quality it is great. absolutely staggering. It, it's great, and uh, you, you're going to love it. You're going to love the way you're treated at beautiful Hylia Park. All right, Brett Tester, the agent of the stars, coming up. And, uh, wow, I, I, I almost sent him a text uh, the other day. I, I, I don't know what happened. I missed the play. But uh, this was uh, with uh, the Minnesota Vikings, yeah. In the uh, kicker is Greg Joseph. The kicker is his. Did he miss an extra point? He did. Because that could have been a factor in what was a three-point spread at the end of uh, the game. And I was thinking, geez, Brett, I wonder with gambling now, I mean, if all of a sudden the dynamic of your fan mail has changed to, uh, (laughs) can you tell this bozo to make an extra point? He made five kicks like two weeks ago. (laughs) They're firing him because he missed one. Get him out of here. Because of the spread, man. I mean, hey, who's Roger Goodell sitting next to? That would be the head of FanDuel or DraftKings. I, I mean, their partners were like everybody. Is Kevin Hart really, uh, is he really betting all of this money? What do you think? Well, Ken brought out a point because I don't really listen to those spots because I think they're a total load of garbage. Ken, <laughs> Hart says it in the commercial, and it's like, did it not catch this? It's almost like the when you talk about the Godfather, how they left the yeah. scene with a horrible punch. Yeah. Um, he talks about, well, do I take the overdog or the underdog? I'm like, overdog is overdog. In yeah, watch it. Exactly. That in? We pay attention to it. exactly. He literally wow. says, and Ken said it. And I'm like, he can't say that. that's not a thing. So the last time they played it, I, I actually sort of paid attention. And he's like, do I take the overdog or the underdog? I'm like, what? Underdog. The expression <laughs> is underdog. Like that's not a, a thing that we're shortening it. Overdog. Like, what do you do? I'm like, you've never gambled ever, Kevin Hart. Right, right. I mean, oh, that's uh, a dead giveaway that you have no idea what you're talking about, right? Oh, so you're yeah, trying to... Jimmy Fox one is great. I'm like, why would you ask Barry Sanders? Barry Sanders hasn't paid attention to an NFL game. In like, I didn't even years. know he was still alive, Sanders. I thought he checked out. I mean, he disappeared completely from the limelight. That's, that's that wasn't point. necessarily his back. By the way, uh, congratulations to Bobby Kraft. He did follow the formula. A lot of people are appalled that an 81-year-old geezer is married like a 47-year-old woman. But do the math, Luby. From the default school of uh, what is the uh, bottom line of the youngest woman. Yes. Well, once you become uh, like an older guy and, and, you know, you're on your, you know, I mean, obviously multiple relationships, but maybe second, third, fourth marriage, uh, that when you're considering a relationship, uh, take your age, divide it in half, add seven years. So if you give him round off, uh, you know, craft's age to 80, uh, then, uh, you know, he's right there in the category, right? 40 plus seven, she's 47. Perfect, the bottom there you go. Good job. He must be a blast to hang out with Bobby Kraft. That, sure. That's got to be a lot of fun. You see, he was at the wedding. A lot of people. No Giselle, though. And uh, it's interesting to see the Bucks staggering now and, yeah. and Brainy struggling to score 20 points a game, which I, I think in half of their games, they haven't even reached 20. Might have only done it once so far, the Buccaneers. And, and this cost him Giselle this season? What do you think, Louie? I mean, that's uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and uh, one of the hot babes uh, considered to be uh, one of the hottest babes on the planet in the, in uh, the world's history, Giselle yes. Bunch. Yes. All because he wanted to come back and play for the stinking Buccaneer team, which uh, <laughs> is Todd <laughs> Bowles' antithesis of offense. And then on top of that, you got the G-Men and the Jets going into Green Bay. Wow. All right. Brett Chester are going to discuss it all with us here on the show. He's coming up in just a few minutes. But if you want to get on Bobby Kraft for being a pedophile, <laughs> this isn't the reason, because he's in the category. He's, he's within the, the confines of the default credo, which is 
Your age, divided by two, add seven years, and that's the bottom line if you're going to date a younger woman. All right, uh, Mike Luby Lewis, a birthday boy, and uh, we'll be out there again at uh, the Bamboo Beach uh, Tiki Bar behind the Ocean Manor Hotel, the Galt Ocean Mile in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Mike Mayo, we're thinking this is going to be a big festive party. Is Mayo ordering strippers or something? What do you think? <laughs> His daughter would never put up with that. Dan, what is this escort service you're calling? <laughs> Why do you have six calls in the Tootsies? Okay. All right. Um, we'll, we'll be out there later on today, and that's going to be a lot of fun uh, with Mike Mayo's Lunchbox and come back with Brett Tesser, then Jack and Jimmy with the Pigskin Playbook coming up. Uh, a ton of things to analyze there and all kinds of different. Uh, I mean, it just was a great, great weekend. All the way. Have you ever seen a greater saturation of sporting events? It even included a couple of fights, right? Deontay Wilder made a comeback. I didn't uh, have any interest in paying money to see that, but, uh, you know, I was interested in the result. And uh, ESPN, uh, they put on uh, what could have been a whale of a show. I, I don't think the fight was as good as it uh, seemed like it was going to be. Uh, but uh, they uh, they had Cambosis against uh, Devin Haney. He's a real good boxer. I mean, a Mayweather type. And uh, it was in Australia. The atmosphere was uh, just absolutely insane because uh, Cambosis is Australian. And uh, he was trying to come back and uh, regain his title after he lost it to Haney. The two guys hate each other. A lot of bad blood. But. The fight itself was unspectacular, I would have to say. I, I forced Tony Segreto to watch it, and uh, he didn't make any comments. He didn't return any of my texts after the fourth round. All right, uh, back with more in a moment. Now that. The time. Pete, we love you, baby. That was a generous offer to buy Kyle a computer. It's uh, 741. The ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style, and you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play. When you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, highly a park. Hey folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapist, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this, if you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled, caring people, there is truly only one place, and that one place is Catholic Health Services. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation location because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. Their hours have changed a little bit. Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 10. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11.30 to 10. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have... They're amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home. The simple pleasures of this job, the way a stadium sounds when one of my players performs well on the field, the way we are meant to protect them in health and in injury. Less, more attention, caring for them, caring for ourselves games to the agent to the stars the one and only brett tesla all right welcome back to the show the uh, depot show here on a peel yourself off the mat monday and of course uh footballs were flying all through the weekend just a tremendous weekend i don't know that you could find uh, any more wild entertainment than we got uh, first from the college football slate and uh, the nfl has been spectacular perhaps so overshadowed uh, this particular weekend by what took place on the college gridiron. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, just thrilling results all over the place and, and a lot of great plays and great players. And, and uh, speaking of greats, and, and I was thinking, uh, does this guy represent everybody in this game? Brett Tusser, the agent of the stars. 
at the Minnesota Kicker, one of his clients, of course, uh, Raheem Mostert. We've talked about many times here on the show over the years. Uh, also uh, represented by uh, the great Brett Tester. Uh, Brent, how are you? And, and did you find yourself in one of those, what was it, Brady Quinn's sister that, that was wearing the shirt one day? Uh, she had her boyfriend was on like one team and <laughs> Quinn was on Notre Dame. Uh, did you find yourself uh, a little bit in a house divided yesterday at the Tesler household? Hey, what's up, guys? No, you know, whenever you have clients going against each other, um, it usually makes the game more fun. There's just more to watch. Um, but this really wasn't two clients going against each other, per se. Obviously, yeah. one's a running back on one team. Uh, the other's a, a, the kicker on the other team. It's not like when you represent, say, a defensive tackle going directly head-to-head against a guard you represent all day. And so, you know, when you're watching that matchup, that's when you're really conflicted because even if you represent a guy on each team, essentially all you want is, you know, A, for as, as in every game, both of you guys to stay healthy and you want them to perform well. And really, at the end of the day, it means very little to me who wins or loses. Now, if you're in a situation where you represent a guy who, you know, is just on a bad team um, with, without the possibility of going anywhere, uh, and, and the other guys on a winning team, then naturally, you know, it makes sense to see the guy on the winning team win the game. Um, but ultimately, you don't really get too caught up in wins or losses. It's more about, again, just wanting my clients to perform well. And um, both my guys did that yesterday as well as they could. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no, it, it's cool. It, it reminds you how fortunate that you are to be in this business because as much as I loved watching football my whole life growing up just as a fan it's it's really kind of a kick in the pants when you know you, you sit there and you're watching and you remember the old days but now you actually you know had something to do with the game you're watching and so uh, it's definitely a rewarding feeling. Excellent. And I think you told us before that, uh, you know, and I know you're a huge boxing fan uh, and, and a big fan of other sports as well but uh that, that you uh, kind of pulled a Don King, that, that, you know, you came into the uh, ring with one guy, and after he got knocked out, you left the ring with the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, contractually now, uh, was obligated to do his next six fights for you, even though uh, he had nothing to do with you before the fight. <laughs> nah, it, it, it's funny. I remember joking around about that. The reality is, you know, at the end of these kind of games, you just, Again, you know, you just hope you can tell each year, each year clients good game. And, um, you know, it was, it was a tough game. And uh, obviously, you know, the Dolphins have to uh, get some things figured out here in the coming weeks. All right, what do you think? Uh, you know what, uh, if I was ever going to put a line through a game and just say, uh, you know, I'm going to consider this kind of an aberration. Uh, I don't expect them to win the ball game. Uh, Minnesota came in, I, I think, maybe overrated at four and one, but uh, nonetheless, they won four of their, uh, their five games. Uh, a lot of people think that Kirk Cousins, uh, I think you even said this on the show, has been liberated by the fact that Mike Zimmer is no longer coaching there, and, and uh, there's much more upside potential for the Vikings. So to have the Vikings coming in, uh, you know, I, I guess at relative full strength, I, I don't know, I, I didn't see an injury report of anything of great significance there, but, uh, you know, I, it wasn't like I was paying close attention to it, but nonetheless, yeah, you're considering that the Vikings are probably in better shape than the Dolphins are to play this game. Uh, since there was such a mystery about the quarterbacks and, uh, they were going to start Skylar Thompson and, uh, other guys uh, supposedly were dinged up, but, um, you know, I, I, I probably would just give them a, a pass on, on this one, but, uh, what, what did you see? I mean, is there something there, uh, with the Dolphins that's particularly troubling or do we have to reserve judgment on this team until, they're sort of back intact, which uh, we're assuming is going to be next Sunday night against the Pittsburgh Steelers with Tua back in the lineup. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that would be most frustrating for a Dolphin fan is the fact that you beat the Bills, who yeah, I think most people they are the best team in the league, either them or Philadelphia. And so if you can beat them, then if you could beat the Ravens, and Lamar Jackson now. I know the Ravens lost yesterday, but Ravens are still a tough team. And Lamar Jackson is still an incredibly difficult guy to try to contain and to try to scheme against. So that certainly was a, a high quality victory. Um, you end up beating the Patriots in the opening game, you know, and the Patriots showed that they won a good, you know, big tough game yesterday. And so when you win three games to start out under those circumstances, and then you lose to a decent Bengals team 
what looks now like like a decent jet team. You wouldn't have thought it at the time. You would think, you know, if you could beat the Ravens and the and the, and the Bills, you should sure as shit be able to beat the Bengals and the Jets. Um, so then you lose to the Vikings again, another good team. Um, and so, it, look, I mean, this is the NFL. Everybody's going to come out and compete. Obviously, teams are better off being healthy and playing with their starters and starting quarterbacks as opposed to having to, you know, go down the line to second and third string players. Now, I'm a big Skylar Thompson fan. And frankly, I was very excited to see how things were going to work out. And frankly, I thought the kid was amazing. But, you know, as often ends up seeming to be the discussion down here, the offensive line's just not getting it done. <sighs> And it's one thing for them to just be getting beat and handled at the point of attack like they are. But now when you're playing completely sloppy and undisciplined and you're actually erasing uh, the, the, the couple good plays that your offense is actually able to make. I mean, Skylar Thompson made, you know, two or three incredible plays. And obviously you're not going to be able to see on a stat sheet because they ended up getting called back for, uh, <clears throat> for penalties. So it's uh it's just incredibly frustrating, I would think, to, to, to be a member of that team because when you have a Tyreek Hill, when you have a Jalen Waddle, when you have you know a guy like Tua emerging the way he was, uh, when you have a running back like Raheem Mostert, when you have a young quarterback like Skylar Thompson, you know you, you you'd like to see what those guys are really truly capable of um, if given the best opportunity to succeed, but. What you saw yesterday, you saw your third string quarterback get knocked out. What is that? Three quarterbacks that have gotten knocked out three weeks in a row. Yeah. Uh, you know, you see the running back you have who coming into this season had the highest average per carry of any running back in history. And you see him just absolutely, you know, fighting for his life out there, you know, to get three and a half yards to carry. And, you know, obviously representing him, I'm watching everything. Uh, repeatedly over and over seeing exactly what went wrong on any given play. <clears throat> and you see that in some of these situations where, you know, either a tight end's missing a wham block, uh, you know, a guard's not getting to a linebacker on the second level and sealing them off. Just the little things that aren't as obvious as a guy just getting defeated one-on-one. -on -one. It's like a chess match out there. And in order for things to really click the way that, you know, that, that Mike McDaniel intends, um, you know, each guy kind of has to do their job. And when you've got multiple guys not doing their job, nobody has a chance. Well, and what's interesting, and yet you sort of reminded me, the other part of it is uh, that the offensive line is sort of a disaster. But um, I think it's clear, clearly Skylar Thompson is better than Bridgewater. I think that's where we are now. And I'm hoping that that switch happens at some point where Thompson is the backup because Bridgewater – is just eh, like he doesn't want to do anything. Thompson made a lot of plays. Like that, one, that offensive line was trying hard to stop him. Literally five. I've never seen that. I've never seen five penalties on one drive. Like I've ne and it wasn't even on one drive. It was on like the, the last quarter of the drive when Thompson kept overcoming penalty, yeah. overcoming penalty, and they kept having him. But the other thing I've noticed, and for those people that didn't think Tua mattered, their offense is night and day when Tua's out there compared to even Skyler. Like when Tua's out there, their offense is humming. Was one of the best offenses in football. Without Tua, that offense is is like grain to a halt. But you're not wrong. With that offensive line, even Tua may struggle because they're not doing anything right now. These last two to three games, that offensive line has been putrid. We're screaming for Tua. It's yeah, crazy. I, I think it would be hard for any quarterback to succeed under those circumstances. And I think, you know, throughout the last 15 years we've been doing this uh, segment <laughs> together. Um, you know, I think Has it been that long, Brad? Seems like yesterday uh, we were just talking about doing this. It's been at least that long, yeah. I yeah. know, I know. But this, this this may be like, you know, the 500 and something time we've said this. <laughs> yes. But who could succeed? Who can succeed under these circumstances? Again, I mean, you see Skyler running for his life, yeah. evading guys, making amazing throws downfield, somehow finding guys, and all these plays are coming back. I mean, the performance yesterday was just unconscionable. There's just no way to sugarcoat it. And again, you know, it's, it's very frustrating to watch when you realize the other pieces that this team has in place. But this is why the old adage, you know, build from the inside out. 
um, because you could have the greatest receiver in the world. He can catch, you know, 200 yards a game. But a lot of that, of course, is because you're getting yourself down in games and you're picking up big chunks of yardage and garbage time and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, when you've had three quarterbacks go down three, uh, you know, what is it, three weeks in a row, maybe that tells you something. Maybe that's more than just bad luck. It's interesting. Speaking of bad luck, I mean, I would imagine the people that passed on Josh Allen feel cursed uh, as uh, he was not the most touted quarterback in that particular draft. But I mean, for uh, the first few years he's been in the league, uh, you know, the, the label that he was uh, somewhat inaccurate but what was always applied to uh, this guy. And yet he makes uh, two of the most incredible throws I've seen uh, dropping just before halftime uh, a, a bomb in the hands of uh, Stefan Diggs, who, who's, uh, you know, barely uh, cleared from the defensive back to trying to uh, guard against him. And then he makes an incredible throw in the corner of the end zone uh, later on. I mean, just uh, there's you know no margin for error there and, and a very uh, small likelihood this pass would be completed. And, you know, that, that turns out to be uh, the winning score against the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, he, he's odds on uh, to, to win the MVP. I think you have to lay a price uh, for him to win the MVP in the AFC. And you mentioned the Bills, and they did stumble at one time against the Dolphins. But even in that game, they dominated the ball game. Uh, how far ahead of the pack are they, in your opinion, uh, Brett Tensler, at this point in the season? Uh, for the rest of the AFC, they, they did get by the Chiefs. Chiefs were in there with a shot. But uh, those, those would appear to be the two teams that, that have the best chance, no? No. Yeah. First of all, you mentioned Josh Allen. I mean, this is truly one of the greatest Cinderella stories in the history yeah. of sports. He's and hurdling I, guys. I, he's doing all kinds of stuff. It, forget about what he's doing now. It's about the fact that, you know, this guy had to beg. This guy, I think, got one Division One offer yeah. in Wyoming. Wyoming. And, and at, at Wyoming. And they show the letter that he wrote where he's essentially begging, hey, just give me a shot. Let me walk on whatever. Yeah. And so – for this guy to elevate himself as a high pick, I thought it was just an incredibly, incredibly risky gamble to draft a guy like this. Because, yes, obviously you're talking about a guy who's got the size, the strength, the athleticism, but he just seemed as inaccurate as any college quarterback could be. And accuracy, unfortunately, as we've seen throughout the years, with the Kyle Bowlers, the Jake Lockers. I mean, these are just a couple names. You know, I mean... When inaccuracy is the knock on a guy coming in, that's one thing that usually doesn't improve. Yep. And the fact that this guy has just, through incredible hard work, great coaching, maturation, whatever it is, uh, the fact that this guy has developed into what he is is truly a one-in-a-million story. So as much as, yeah, the teams that could have drafted him obviously look back and say, gee, you know, wish we'd done that. I don't think anybody can really kick themselves there. I don't think that's one of those ones where anybody could be like, duh. You know, yeah. I mean, maybe a guy like Justin Herbert. You know, Justin Herbert was, you know, some people were more on the side of, hey, this is the guy you should draft. You know, now I'm not an expert on these things, so I don't know. But I'm just saying, you know, that would seem like there was a little more obviousness going on with a guy like Herbert. Whereas with Allen, my attitude was, boy, you know, some team might make a huge mistake drafting that guy. But the way it's panned out for both he and his team is truly just a fairy tale story because, you know, now you've got a guy who is the best quarterback in the NFL, probably, uh, especially if you want to go based off last night's matchup. I mean, if, if it's between him and Mahomes, uh, the statistics and the win column clearly show who, you know, outplayed who last night. Um, you know, and then you look at the success of the team. And where they'll probably be going as the season uh, continues on, it's really uh, a great story. And it's a story that should be very inspirational and should give a lot of hope to some of the other fan bases out there that, you know, have been supporting a struggling team that, hey, maybe one day we can find our Josh Allen. I mean, the distinguishing characteristic for me uh, with the quarterback, uh, you know, it was demonstrated there right before the end of the half with Josh Allen. Uh, they're backed up to the two-yard line uh, when they get possession of the ball uh, after a penalty. And uh, I think they took it at the four. They're backed up to the two. They have a third and like 12 or something, uh, you know, just a ridiculous uh, amount of ground to make up. 
uh, Kansas City uh, stops them there, they're probably going to score and uh, end up, uh, you know, in a much more favorable position, obviously. Uh, and the guy completes like a, an impossible 15-yard pass for the first down and then takes them down the field in less than a minute, and, and they score uh, the go-ahead touchdown. Uh, in that game. Uh, and remarkably, with 12 seconds to go, uh, Mahomes uh, orchestrates a drive good enough to get uh, in the field goal range, and a guy kicks one from 62. But, uh, I mean, the measuring stick of a quarterback is, is can you do this kind of stuff in those situations where you, you need to make something happen? And and, and most guys don't. Uh, you, you would have been content to see the guy, oh, please, just don't get a safety, punt the ball out of there, and you hope you hold uh, Kansas City to a field goal in that spot. And this guy instead, I mean, has a remarkable drive, takes him right down the field after a tremendous throw on uh, third down and, and takes him the rest of the way for a touchdown. And, I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that, that you're looking for from uh, a guy that's really going to be – a, a uh, you know carry a team on his shoulders type of quarterback, which is what you need in this league now. It seems like to win. I can't believe I'm saying it, Keith. I mean, it, it, he's like this generation's John Elway, maybe even better because yeah. he's got that kind of skill set. When you think about John Elway with his size and strength, and you think about his ability, obviously to uh, to keep defenses on their heels with his feet. And then his ability to just chuck the ball, you know, from any angle, any position on the field, you know, just that kind of arm. That's, you know, somebody who grew up watching the Elways, the Marinos, the Montanas. It's just like watching John Elway. And, you know, similar to Elway, they both kind of struggled a little bit uh, their rookie year. And then Allen took a really big step. And then again, he's gotten to a point where, honestly, the things he's doing with the efficiency he's doing it, may actually even be better than what we saw from Elway. So it's, it's, it's nothing short of amazing. And uh, again, as a fan of football, I'm just happy that every Sunday we can look forward to watching guys like this emerge as the next generation because like what happens in every generation, you wonder who's going to replace the Marinos, the Montanas, and then you get the Rogers, the Rogerses and the Mannings, and you wonder – you know, and the Brady's, and you wonder who's going to replace those guys. And now you got, you know, Mahomes, you got Herbert, um, you've got Josh Allen, and a few other guys. So, you know, definitely uh, a, a great new generation of quarterbacks uh, emerging. Bailey Zappi. I, I tell you what, who is always uh, destined for greatness. I mean, everybody knew this guy was going to make it big. And uh, the job that he does is remarkable. And uh, wow. I mean, uh, no need to evolve to uh, any higher level. He's already there. Uh, the great Michael D. Wild, when it comes to wills and trusts and estate planning, uh, this is the Josh Allen uh, of the legal world. Yeah. The one thing I beg everybody listening every week we talk, Deef, is stop procrastinating when it comes to getting um, your estate taken care of. You know, if you don't have a will, if you don't have a trust, these are things that if, God forbid, something happens to you, it's going to put your family in an even worse situation and so reach out to michael wild southfloridawills.com you know for all the reasons you feel like you don't want to deal with this now either it's going to take too much time it's going to cost too much money you know, you'll get around to it next month just trust me reach out to him at southfloridawills.com in the blink of an eye the situation is handled <clears throat> it's taken care of in the best way possible and it doesn't cost you a lot of money and once it's done, it takes a huge weight off your back. Reach out to Michael Wild, com. Run this by Michael Wild. I have a marketing slogan for him. Uh, Michael Wild, the only way to really rest in peace. What, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. All right. You, you're, you're a marketing guy. I mean, uh, you know, so if you appreciate that, I, it just struck me. It really is. It's the only way to rest in peace. And that is to uh, make sure you engage the services of one Michael D. Wild. Brett, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. And, uh, you know, ha have a great week. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next time here on the show. Thanks, Tess, man. All right, guys. Always a pleasure. Have a great one. And uh, talk to you soon. There you go. Michael D. Wild. <laughs> Wait, oh, really? I don't, it actually is catchy, but something about the only it way to rest in peace. <laughs> something about it weirds me out. Resting in peace is kind of a <laughs> bizarre know. concept to me. I don't know. Do you rest in peace? I mean, I would you go to degenerate hell there, where all of your bets are losers, and you never have enough money to get out. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I'm living my life.
All right. I mean, uh, th- this guy is great, man, uh, coming up. And there should be, I mean, you talk about a full plate of things, topical sports material. That would be in this weekend of college and pro football. John Kajemi with the Pigskin Playbook coming up. Brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, Mile Marker 104, the Overseas Highway in Key Largo. I'm Jeff DeForest. He is uh, one Mike Luby Lubitz, the birthday boy later on. Celebration, you can come join us. Bamboo Beach Tiki oh, Bar behind the Ocean Manor Hotel, Galt Ocean Manor. I think I'm thinking it's going to be a nice day. I don't know. I'm looking outside here. It's hard to tell here because the curtains are closed. But uh, is it a little schmutzy out there? Hoping for a nice sunny day there on the beach. A sunny day. All right. uh, Sunshine coming your way in just a second here in the form of one John Kajemi. He's joining us next. Now that. It's time. 8.05. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously, friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, <laughs> no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes, really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day. Everything, and I mean everything, is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. Recently, we realized it's not just hurricane season that can hurt us. Any time of year, things can happen to your home or business. And the insurance company can be your friend, but they also can be your enemy. Horizon Public Adjusters, Justina Testa, are here for you to help this process go so much easier. Before you call the insurance company, call Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa at 954-809-8752. Jimmy Johnson uh, joins us here on the program, along with John Kajemi, and it's Dateline Dolphins, of course. Hey, Coach, you were talking about, you know, different ways you, to motivate guys, different ways to talk to guys, talking about Brian Floor. And I think just listening to him talk to his team, I think it resonates with a lot of guys. I think that's an important ingredient if you're sitting in the room and you actually believe with a guy that man is telling you that's your head coach. How did you feel about that, your message resonating with your team? You know, Johnny, at it, any level, I think you're exactly right. I've never been a dreamer. I, I've never dreamed about stuff because if you dream, that means you got your fingers crossed and you're hoping. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I believe, you know, when we were at University of Miami, the graduation rate was right about 50 percent, which that's about what the student body is. And and so, you know, I, I looked at it and we were recruiting these inner city kids. And from day one, I talked to them about when they got their college degree. You know, if you really believe in something, John, it's part of your personality. My personality was, hey, these guys are college graduates. We were one in 15 in Dallas, and I took my guys out, Tony and Dave and Butch and all that crew. We went to a little restaurant, and I said, guys, just hang with me. I told you we are going to win a national championship when I was at Oklahoma State. Now, we had to go to another university to do it, but we won it. I said, hang with me. We're going to win a Super Bowl. We operated as if we were going to win a Super Bowl. It wasn't hoping. It wasn't dreaming. It was believing. And I think that if that's your personality, it carries over to the players. Right. It carries over to the assistant coaches. That's the way they deal with the players. And, hey, after a couple of years, all of a sudden, <laughs> the players are believing they're going to win it. I think that motivates the average player to be a good player. The best way to kick off your day is with Defo plus Luby. We now return to the Defo Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, peel yourself off the mat Monday. Although this guy never looks like he peeled himself off the mat, does he, Mike Luby Lubitz? Ever. Always looks, I mean, just uh, completely uh, ready to go busy. and making a, you know, a tremendous positive presentation of himself. Uh, the great John Kajemi uh, joins us here for a little pigskin playbook, uh, a.k.a. Dateline Dolphins. Uh, John, you look great. Uh, how are you today, my friend? 
I'm just appreciative. Thanks for sending hair and makeup over so early today, guys. It, it really <laughs> went over well. Uh, no, hey, what a weekend for for college football Whoa. for the yeah. NFL. Uh, it, it was uh, it was crazy. Um, mixing in my my uh, class reunion on Saturday afternoon. Get out of here. At, How at many years? Deck of all places where we used to sneak in uh, high school. You know, forty two years ago. Yeah, high school. Uh, it was great. We had wow. a great great weekend this weekend. Tommy Fox there? Did you mention Tommy uh, the Fox show? Tommy Fox was not Big there. <laughs> I, I told him I probably should have called him again to tell him, but uh, yeah. I, I got Oh, he doesn't the... even get invited to these things? He, no, <laughs> Tom's always invited. Tom was oh, the center right. of attention in high school, but yeah. I forgot to, to call him. I was only there for uh, a couple minutes, but um, it was great. It was great to see people. This was yesterday? I mean, you squeezed this that This was in on between... uh, Saturday. Oh, okay. This was Saturday, yeah. Saturday. Uh, well, let's start there with Saturday because it was a glorious day for me. I mean, uh, nothing better than seeing that smarmy, repugnant, oh, yeah. smug yeah. Nick Saban. I mean, first he goes yeah. ape on the sidelines there on some kid. I mean, yeah. uh, beyond Woody Hayes, he, he stopped just short of punching a kid. And I, I thought that was a fine representation of his uh, concept when he's on these interviews, which uh, they're, they're fawning all over him. And they say, uh, Nick, uh, you know, what is this? real key to your success. And he says, well, it's my caring about the kids and their well-being and their mental health and all of this shit. Meanwhile, he's on the sideline there on national TV, the biggest college game of the year. I mean, just absolutely embarrassing, this poor kid. I mean, whether that's mentoring, it looked more like bullying to me. Uh, you know, Just if I was imagine if Saban had any kind of weapon in his hand at, at yeah. that moment of time. He's ready to kill some poor 18-year-old kid. They would have had a, you know, a paddy wagon would have come right to Neyland Stadium exactly. and taken him away. Oh, and after the game, I mean, it was just glorious for me oh. to see him uh, smugly sitting there and going, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, the 17 penalties probably didn't help us any. Uh, you know, you're like, hey, shut the fuck up, Nick. Th that's on you, <laughs> is it not? <laughs> How many times have we said it on these shows? I mean, after a ball game, well, you know what? They uh, are undisciplined, and that pertains to coaching. So does that apply to Nick Saban when his team essentially loses a game because they incurred like 800 yards worth of penalties? The only vision I had when he was saying all that stuff was a mom or a dad trying to feed their their young child in a in a a seat, a booster seat, and they're jamming yeah. the the uh, you know the apricot <laughs> sauce in his mouth, and the son the son or daughter just won't open their mouth. Yeah. That's what it felt like. I mean, everybody has to go through it. Nick Saban goes through it maybe once every you know eight years like yeah. that but everybody everybody you're not immune to that you know it's college football it's young kids you're going to make mistakes you're going to get into an environment where it's going to be kind of even and those little things add up and i i think on saturday alabama fought tried to fight through that and almost got to the other side of it yeah and and the dolphins on sunday were the same way with penalties mistakes and every right to win that game uh they it's one play, you know, you're thinking if one one laser beam to Waddle or Hill changes the complexion of the game, we didn't know it was going to be Dalvin Cook that was going to provide that on the yeah. other side. Well, and, and uh, you know, you, you had you mentioned uh, Waddle, who's been uh, great uh, and I think a uh, brilliant player. But uh, unfortunately, when it looked like the, the Finns were going to have uh, more than a fighting yeah. chance to uh, overcome all of this uh, adversity and mistakes and all the different things and losing Skylar Thompson at the beginning of the game and then going into a different kind of rhythm uh, with uh, Teddy Bridgewater, which a lot of people have kind of, uh, you know, uh, lowered their opinion, I guess, uh, of Teddy Bridgewater as a backup. It seems like uh, he is a ye of little faith at this point uh, for Dolphin fans. Now, uh, maybe because he's been involved in a couple of losses, but that Waddle fumble, unfortunately, I mean, it was such a, I mean, a momentum changer and game changer that, uh, you know, in essence, I think that iced the ball game uh, for Minnesota. I don't think, you, you know, you need to be a genius, uh, you know, to figure that out. Yeah, I'm not even sure if Smith, the safety uh, for Minnesota, yeah, he got a hand on it maybe, but it almost looked like Waddle was avoiding contact and kind of just, you know, yeah. that added to him Shame. losing the football. Yeah. And, you know, bridge over troubled waters for Teddy, right? Like how, yeah. how many times are you going to, it, it, in my in my heart of hearts, it's almost like I don't know if Teddy signed up for this. I think yeah. Teddy signed up to say, you know what, I'm going to be the backup. If you need me for a quarter, two quarters, one game, you know, if Tua's, you know, kind of banged up or bruised down the stretch, I can fill in. I, I don't know if he signed up to be running all for his life against an offensive line without two or three starters and 
you know, I, I don't know if that's going to fit what what his body allows him to do now as a quarterback. John, for so often we've talked, and Brett Tesler was sort of mocking. We've had him on for over a decade, and it's been a recurring theme. Um, and look, they try to address the offensive line. They brought in Turner Armstead, who was by far the best uh, free agent possibility at offensive line. Connor Williams was one of the best guards now, centers available in free agency. So they tried, and they drafted Eichenberg, and they drafted Austin Jackson. And Hunt was actually a guy that they drafted late, who's actually turned out to be a good offensive lineman. But we see this with the injury, so they, you have to have depth, you have to have talent. This line's a disaster right now. And the funny thing is you can clearly see what this team is with Tua, but I don't know if I want Tua playing behind that line. Like, Tua may not survive. How do you fix that in the middle of a season? How do you make patchwork makeshift defense? And I always joke about this. That line, because they have everywhere else, the defense finally played the way we thought the defense could play. They yeah. were swarming. The yeah. offense was moving the ball, but the offensive line kept either giving up pass protection or stupid-ass penalties where they got in their own way. I, I, it's hard to win with that kind of a line. I will say this. Bringing Tua back healthy is going to help the offensive line because the ball is going to get out quicker. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have more accuracy. You're going to have more timing in the pass offense. You're going to have more synergy in, in the way that Mike McDaniel wants to call plays, the way he wants to get to the line of scrimmage. Uh, I, I think that will help the offensive line. Now, now going to the offensive line, in the offseason, yes, Armstead was the prize of that, you know, of that bunch. But if you go through history, and we talked about this. Remember I was telling you I talked to a, a Saints coach that said, I'd be shocked if Armstead makes it through eight and a half games. Oh, yeah. And I'd be shocked if Armstead makes it through X amount of games. Well, we're, we're seeing that. Uh, not only can he not practice during the week, well, with his toe injury, he can't play either now. So you couple that with Jackson on the other side that's been out for four weeks with a, a sprain, a high ankle sprain, that I would think he should be ready to go um, this week against the Steelers on Sunday night. And, poor, and, and, a, and a regressing young guard as Eichenberg. I don't think he's improving. I think he's regressing if you watch some of the misses and some of the way he's been playing. So – I think you mix, put that in that whole, you know, that Dolphin offensive bag and you mix it around. Thank, you know, I don't know if Dolphin fans or a lot of Dolphin fans, maybe half of them would be saying, thank God Tua is coming back because, you know, we can't wait for him to, to help salvage this mess we have now on the offense because it, it seemed like it was clicking in terms of points, explosive plays, all the, thing you need, all the things you need to have in, in the NFL today. Because you look around the league, and that's what all the good teams are doing. They have enough explosive plays. They have a quarterback that changes the way the outcome of the game is because he's he's in control. Well, you don't have that without Tua on this on this football team. It's funny the uh, narratives uh, in the National Football League, uh, especially uh, formulated in the preseason, are often misguided. Uh, we all thought this was going to be the soft spot on the schedule for the Miami Dolphins yeah, if they could I, just somehow yes. get through those first four at a deuce and a deuce, two and two. And, uh, you know, so far it's been very much, uh, you know, uh, an obscure boxing reference, if you don't mind. But uh, the uh, first De La Hoya mosley uh, fight uh, where, where one guy wins the first six rounds and the other guy just clearly wins the second six. Uh, it's kind of gone that way. I mean, uh, the Dolphins brilliant in the first three games. And uh, so, so to, uh, as Luby would say, eh. In the last three, and uh, we don't know exactly where they're at, although uh, we're back to this common theme, John, uh, about, you know, well, geez, if they could only block somebody, you know, <laughs> we might be in there uh, with a shot. Uh, you know, so many other things, too, uh, you know, went on. And, and I want to get into the uh, college slate because that, that was fascinating on Saturday. And, and, of course, the rest of the pro card, Philadelphia remains unbeaten, uh, kind of dominant last night, although uh, the game got tight there for a brief moment. And, uh, wow, I mean, wouldn't you have enjoyed if when you were playing at Pitt or uh, in your career in the pros, if you had a kicker on your team who could hit from 60? That and, was and you impressive. Th thought nothing of it? I mean, even in the Dallas game last night, this Cowboys kicker, and uh, this was a dagger in my back as uh, I was, uh, you know, getting six points with the Cowboys against Philadelphia, right? They're down nine. Uh, a guy's going to kick an impossible field goal. It, it, it's it's. It's high. It's far. It's like John <laughs> Sterling is calling this kick. And then, uh, oh, oh, cut at the fucking wall. You're like, 
<laughs> I don't know if you're, you, you know, are you a big baseball follower? You must hang out with some Yankees fans. I used fans. to be. I used are, to be, yes. Are they the worst crying babies that you've ever seen? I mean, they've already, they, they threw in the towel after Cleveland took a 2-1 lead. And all you saw across all of social media was, oh, man, this Aaron Boone's an asshole. And, uh, you know, Cashman's got to go. And so-and-so's a bust. Uh, you know, they even turned on Aaron Judge. <laughs> Yeah. They booed Aaron Judge. They booed him, 62. Booed him. The guy who had one of the most spectacular seasons in the history of the game, right in front of their eyes, carried the team on his back uh, like he was, uh, you know, uh, in the WWE. And, uh, you know, he was John Cena or something. He even looks a little Cena-esque. And they're booing him. I I've never heard a bunch of bigger crying babies. And, uh, you know, you've had, you know, your share of experience with this because you you've been hosting any number of editions of Dolphins Crying Towel. In the post game, uh, you know, right. I, I don't know. Were you taking calls there with the Finsiders when you were doing that post game show? On a very limited basis, as the years went on, yes. Always scary to open up the phone lines at that point, <laughs> isn't that? I mean, you, you kind of know it what is. you're going to get. You're almost hoping for it, right? You're hoping some guy calls in and just tees off on Miami, and uh, that way you don't have to be the one that says it. <laughs> as, as Stephen Ross is saying, uh, "What are those guys saying on the show? I'm paying them." <laughs> Yeah, uh, exactly. Not that you were ever inclined to, you know, go along with the house, uh, but uh, let's face it. Uh, you know, I, I often took a little bit more favorable view of things than the fans would after a loss. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I never heard a bunch of bigger crying babies than, than these Yankee fans. So, uh, and and they have a great chance to uh, end up winning the series. Uh, the Dolphin fans, uh, you know, seem to be. I don't know where where would you be at? I mean, uh, the psyche of a Dolphin fan right now should be what, John Kajemi? I would say worried. I would yeah. say worried because it, we talked about this, and you you said it perfectly. Two and two after the first four games would yeah. have been highly acceptable because, you know, I, I didn't know how it was going to shake out, but I figured, well, the Bills at home, no matter how good we think we are, I just don't know if we're a better team. And, you know, Baltimore would have been, you know, a, a, a toss-up, but going on a short week to Cincinnati – that didn't look good. So if you could no, steal one definitely. in Baltimore, you're two and two. Well, the way it shook out, you're still two and two. And, you know, you're three and one. And you go down and, and it's the Jets. You know, it's and, and the Jets who won again yesterday. Maybe aren't as bad as we thought. Yeah, exactly. So they may have found something, you know, with some of those young players. But this is, when you look at the Dolphins, the main reason you could say is the health of the Miami Dolphins. I don't think that, you know, this it's a mash unit. It It's bad. And it got worse yesterday. Sure. You know, Nick Needham goes down with a, a look like a serious right leg injury. I don't know if it was ankle, shin, Achilles. I'm, I, I don't know. Somewhere, you know, lower leg was bad. Keon Crossan, you know, goes down. Um, you had uh, Trey Flowers that went in and out of the locker room a couple of times. The, there was a, a bunch of guys that, that you're hoping that, can line up and play against the Steelers, no matter if it's Trubisky. You know, it looks like uh, Kenny's going to be in concussion protocol now. So it, it's going to be a – no matter who plays quarterback for the Steelers, it's going to be another physical game that could be a one-possession game. It's going to probably look – it might not be as sloppy as the Minnesota game, but it may look a lot like the Minnesota game where there's a lot going on between the 20s and whoever can get an explosive play at the end, a defensive strip sack, uh, a bad miscue on special teams, that's the team that's going to end up winning that football game. It's funny, too, because uh, Pittsburgh is uh, next up after pulling off that upset against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Heavy underdogs, I think they were eight-and-a-half-point dogs. And Pittsburgh was a team, uh, with all due respect, I don't know if you have the same attachment for the pro team there as you do, uh, obviously, for the college team, John, having played there uh, for the Panthers in the footsteps of Marino. That should be said in a Facenda voice, should it not? <laughs> in the footsteps of Dan Marino. I think you did that once. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, because uh, it's appropriate. But, uh, you know, and, and they, they're, they're supposed to be horrible. Now, now, Tom Brady, in, in post-game press conferences, win or lose, has always been uh, very diplomatic. He doesn't say anything of any substance, but uh, extremely diplomatic when, uh, you know, uh, presented with some kind of a negative scenario to comment on. Uh, and, and I don't know if you saw this, but he opened up uh, the press conference after the game and he said, I gave up Giselle for this. <laughs> I missed that. They were like, whoa, holy Jim Gray. What was that? That went right over my head. I totally missed that. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, uh, look, uh, three and three, as Jim Sarney is uh, pointing out here on our chat line, 
I mean, it doesn't put you in bad straits. I, I would think this, I, I could justify this away because I, I thought the Dolphins were going to be a, a much better team this year than they were. You were a little reluctant to embrace that until you saw the first uh, couple anyway. And uh, it looked like uh, Tua had progressed and that this Mike McDaniel system uh, was very innovative. Tyreek Hill. Wow. I mean, what can you say yeah. about this guy? And, um, you know, I, I, I love Jalen Waddle fumble uh, notwithstanding. Uh, you know, still a, a dynamic pair on the outside. It's a shame that they can't find, you know, somebody that can get in there and, and block for him because, uh, well, you know, you the juggling the of quarterbacks, I mean, that's that got to be the worst thing. It's the old thing they used to say in college. Well, if you have two starting quarterbacks, you don't have a starter. Uh, this is worse because you've been, you know, just – constantly uh, changing uh, the dynamic of what you're doing on offense with three different quarterbacks. So all just getting pieces of the action. I will say this about Hill and Waddle. If you can get some of the other guys to pick up their game and give that type of effort yeah. on a consistent basis, the Miami Dolphins are going to win football games. Uh, these guys go a hundred miles an hour. Uh, th they're so productive. They're always open. And they're complementary of each other. I don't know if you remember the crossing route that Waddle caught. He kind of jumped in the air. He probably didn't need to jump, but catches it easily. It was like a plus 25, 30-yard play. Tyreek Hill is blazing down the middle wow. of the field. And he's he must have <laughs> took two or three defenders with him. Because they were yeah. like, holy shit, there goes Hill. Everybody got on their horse and started running. Yeah. And it left Waddle. All he had to do was outrun a linebacker from one side of the field to the other. And it, it was easy for the quarterback. You know, it's like, just another I'll hold it another count if I can just to let Waddle cross the field and it's you know just lay it out there and those are the types of plays that just these two guys with scheme from McDaniel and their effort give you and if you can just I mean if the line can give just a little bit more it, you know each guy can give just a little bit more no matter who's playing quarterback you've got a chance when you have those guys healthy and and given the effort that they do give because that effort brings huge production in the passing game roadrunner like acceleration with Tyreek yeah. Hill I, I forget what uh, what was the reason that people thought he was somewhat of a misfit malcontent uh, with Kansas City was it a woman thing uh well, I, what know, were I his off-field problems uh, but uh, he did remember. seem like he had a little bit of Kyrie Irving uh, you know type of uh, distancing himself from uh, the concept of uh, you know the team culture and buying into that but uh, wow I mean it couldn't be any more the opposite this guy goes out there and, and literally plays hard you know, and, and that, that I would imagine would be somewhat contagious when, when you see your star player just got all this money. And, uh, you know, there are times that you do see star players uh, really struggle once they get the pot of gold. Uh, anything but the case. And the guy goes out there and, you know, it seems to bring it, uh, you know, with everything that he has, uh, you know, on every and possession. The good thing, yeah. And the good thing, Defo, too, on the sidelines, he was not letting those guys lay down. He was getting all over them. You know, he was yeah. one of those guys that he was he was mad because he wasn't he, they, his production wasn't helping things but he i think he was getting on the other guys to say listen at least you have to get to my level to to ha give us a chance to win and I, it was good to see that because somebody needed to step up because that was a winnable game I, you know fans do it all the time i'm sure players do it when you go back and you look and you go and you circle that one and go man that minnesota game one play if we could make one play in that game and it turns the tide, that's a huge win at home. You know, that's a team you're supposed to beat at home um, because they're kind of – I don't think they're elite. I think they're good. But I don't think they're in the class of, you know, a Buffalo, a Kansas City, right now a Philadelphia, you know, on that side of, of the fence. I think Philadelphia beats them by 10 points easy, 10, yeah. 10 12, 14 points, especially if they're playing if – if Minnesota's on the road like they were against the Dolphins. I think Philadelphia beat well, them easy at home. And, and it was just the opposite of what you usually think, uh, you know, the meltdown uh, coming in the second half because, I mean, they come out, they get stymied six straight six, uh, three and outs. They I mean, had when, nine when on the needed? game. Wow. They, they had nine straight. three and outs on the game. They had two series that, that were productive. That, three that and outs. Good. Not even one dink pass that goes for 10, you know, and so you have like uh, at least one first down at the 35. Nothing. Uh, you know, so, so that was, uh, and you know, the offense was moving, even though they weren't producing points. So uh, when, when Skylar Thompson was, was in the game, all right. Uh, I Skylar I, Thompson played great. I, he, I thought, he looks I good. He played really, really no good. No doubt. He, he's showing more, you know, likelihood that uh, he, he will be a success in the league. And, and, and it was the type of quarterback that can have that kind of success where, you know, as 
we were talking about uh, earlier with Josh Allen with Brett Tesler. I mean, you know, that man has evolved into something that I don't know that anybody could have really anticipated. But with a couple of the throws that he made in that game against the Chiefs yesterday, I mean, uh, abs- that throw into the corner of the end zone that uh, gave him yeah. a go-ahead touch, that, that's a congemi throw right hey, there. Hey, listen, I'm sitting, with, I'm sitting with Dan Marino, and we're watching the, the Marino, game. Yeah. And Dan goes, whoa, that was <laughs> that was a, that impossible. Was good. Yeah, that was I mean, really good. Peyton the black on the outside corner to a guy that's, uh, you know, uh, well covered and falling out of bounds. And, and there's it's, really only one spot long way across the field. That was, that, you're really was not supposed bullet. to throw that. I mean, yeah. you're not supposed to throw that because the, the coverage dictated it. And you had the guy that almost got a piece of it fell, falls off from the corner. It goes right by his hand. Yeah. And then, you know, the guy that's covering on the play had leverage, you know, and all of a sudden Josh Allen brings his receiver back towards the front pile on. It was a, it was a spectacular. Oh, it puts the ball, as you said, right on the spot. I mean, the thing that amazes me about the pros, and you're, you're well aware of this, is that there, there seem to be more intermittent hands and, and obstacles to navigate on any throw in the pros as compared to a throw in college. Where, you know, there is that guy that's uh, sort of in the intermediate position there that's in a spot where, I mean, he he can easily intercept the ball, but it somehow gets by him and has to have the trajectory still to land on the lower outside corner and and, uh, be caught by, in in the only spot that this guy could have possibly caught the ball or where it wouldn't have been defended. And he lands it in there. I mean, just absolutely perfect throw. Uh, I, we've seen Herbert make a couple of throws like that late last season, I guess, in one of the key games that was featured on TV. And a couple yeah. of other guys, you would probably say Mahomes could do it. Mm-hmm. But uh, Allen, you know, for a guy that w- was deemed to be an inaccurate thrower, and that was a big knock on him, I mean, has become spectacular in that category, including dropping. Uh, I mean, th- that was also, it reminded me of you, John Kajemi, where he had I mean, just perfect trajectory on a ball there at the end of the half. Uh, to Stefan Diggs uh, for, you know, nothing better, right, than completing a fly pattern uh, over the top of a solo-covered receiver. Yeah, and small margin for Aaron, yet he drops it right in there like it was nothing. Uh, All right, uh, you know, I had a big, uh, you know, lucky night on Friday. I had Navy getting 12 and a half. Nice. And uh, they, they go in as disgusting as it is to watch Navy football for me because I hate that offense. Uh, and nothing against the military academy. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're big supporters of anybody that uh, serves our country in the military. But uh, the Navy football team, I don't know. I don't give a shit about them. I, I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I get Navy in my individual bookmaking proposition that I have going uh, with my buddy Francesco, uh, who has been swinging really badly. And uh, I, I watched this game with a little bit of interest, and, and they score with 12 seconds to go a, a backdoor touchdown that uh, is not going to really i mean they, they, uh, yeah they have an outside chance of getting the onside kick and winning the game but not happening uh but it covers the point spread and i was thinking well how lucky am i and then i cash getting 34 with fiu and right. i thought the only way to really capitalize on this and, and really turn it into a monster weekend is to get down to jimmy johnson's big chill <laughs> which I whiffed on uh, due to the fact, you know, I, I, I was relatively unmotivated on Saturday to do anything but lay in bed. But, uh, I mean, that would have been the place to go, would it not? And just spectacular arrangement of food, fun, and uh, just frolicking in the sunshine there in the sand. It, it, it's absolutely a fantastic place, John. The only thing better, Defoe, is if you had the uh, if you had Tennessee ticket and you're sitting in yeah. Jimmy Johnson's sports bar there at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, and yeah. you were able to celebrate with everybody else that, Disliked uh, Nick Saban and the. Do they hate Nick down there? I, I would think so. I think that, that's that's Keys Bama. I think Keys might have some Bama ties. Who no? knows? I, I, maybe there might be some outliers down there, but the majority are are South Florida fans. I, I would okay. think. Yeah. And um, yeah, you're right. How how cool would it be just to kind of hang out, put your put your feet up, and uh, go to the tiki bar and, and order your favorite beverage and just kick back and relax and. The food's outstanding. First class service you get down there. Jimmy Johnson's big chill, and and the and the sights and sounds. I mean, it doesn't get Ooh. much better in the Florida Keys. Phenomenal too. How, how do they support having all that live music? Are these guys just getting up there and playing for free? I know uh, Larry Calvano and your brother get up there and play for free, but uh, did the bands just donate their time? I mean, they have like four or five bands there. That, that's got to no, be you know I expensive. Think, prop. I think Larry's doing a good job. He's he's digging deep in the pockets and and, wow. and chilling out for these guys. And, and you know what? It, the the crowd comes for him. They know exactly who's playing on Sundays and you know on the weekends and 
and they, they come out and support and it's great guys that are going, you know, further down to Key West that are on their way back to, you know, Broward County or, or Dade County. They know they can stop at Jimmy Johnson's and get something to eat and drink and listen to, to great music uh, before they, you know, trek back to where they're going uh, in South Florida. It's a veritable uh, music festival there. It really is. I, I was very impressed by that because uh, the last thing you want to encounter when you're in a Keynes resort is, is that steel drummer that also has like the electronics. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's, uh, you know, playing feelings on the steel drums. And, and you're just like, that. you, you want to put a bullet in the guy's head. Whereas uh, at, at Jimmy Johnson's, all you want to do is have a cocktail in your hand and something great to eat. Great place. Uh, the combinations are, are absolutely sensational. And you can check that out online at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill dot com. I, 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 I'm really uh, I'm saddened by the fact that Tommy Fox was not aware of the high school reunion because I, I think he would have gone. He, he, he definitely really enjoys would have gone. You know, I, I yeah. mentioned it to him, but I probably should have hit him with another text because, quite frankly, I forgot until a buddy of mine hit me up at the last minute. And so I, you know, kind of ran down there and it was fun. It was great yeah. to see uh, old friends. I, I Quick, funny story. I'm, I'm watching. How many years, though, John? How many 40, years did you say? 40 this years. was your 40 year high school reunion? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. You don't look so, it. I mean, it, it was, it was great Defoe, All these guys are hanging out. There's probably 10 or 12 guys that I were friends of mine in high school that I see periodically. Some I see a lot more than others, but yeah. there was a guy at the bar and he thought he was buying a drink for somebody else. And he <laughs> says here, you know, and I said, thanks. That was the first drink you bought me in like 40 years, you know, and I just took the drink <laughs> and walked away and he's give me that John, you're not the son of a bitch. That's not yours. Dude. You know, Give it to somebody oh, yeah, yeah, else. yeah, to pass it off. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's a loopy move off. there to intercept somebody else's cocktail. Uh, well, I mean, and what is the most commonly asked question at reunions of 30 years or over, uh, whether it's high school or college? Gosh. Most commonly asked question. I don't is, know. Uh, uh, I'm always greeted with this. Uh, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody, what are you doing now? You know, how, yeah. you have, you know how's your family? You know, like, that's probably... I just come right out with it. What happened to you? Yeah. You know, I mean, like... The girl that was absolutely unapproachable because he was so uh, gorgeous that uh, no matter how much confidence you had, you would melt, you know, in her presence. And uh, then you see her like 40 years later. And you're like, hey, Nancy, what happened to you? <laughs> nah, you would never insult somebody like that. But, uh, you know, when the guys go, that's usually a very common theme. Exactly. All right. Uh, much more to discuss here. John Kajemi, uh and brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, Mile Marker 104, the Overseas Highway. Uh, again, all over TV yesterday. And, uh, you know, good job there of, uh, you know, the, the anxiety has to be mounting. Because you're yeah. wondering, those of us that had confidence in the over at 89, <laughs> seeing some of that start to melt away, right? Is this, this the song spot of the schedule? Somehow I knew that conversation was leading to eight and a half. <laughs> the hook, I think, is going to get me, you know, like a spear. All right, uh, back with more in a moment. Now that. The time... Ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style, and you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette, in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play, when you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, Hylia Park. Hey folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapist, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this, if you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled caring people there is truly only one place and that one place is catholic health services these days we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it thank goodness for land lovers raw bar and grill in the plantation location because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible first of all they're not only open for delivery and pickup 
All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. Their hours have changed a little bit. Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 10. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11.30 to 10. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have their amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers Raw Bar and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home. Jimmy Johnson uh, joins us here on the program, along with John Congemi, and it's Dateline Dolphins, of course, uh, Leslie Visser, the lovely and talented one. Did you ever try to recruit Troy when he was leaving Oklahoma to come to Miami? Yeah, I tried to recruit him three different times. I was in his home uh, as sophomore in high school. I had him in our camp, in our camp, and I gave him the award as the best camper. No. <laughs> that's, that was, that that's, was good thing. Really? Yeah. So, <laughs> I gave him a trophy. Best you know, camper. <laughs> he was the best camper, and I gave him the trophy. If I could have given him a couple thousand dollars, it would have been legal. <laughs> hey, Troy, look underneath the zipper. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, he ended up going to Oklahoma. So then with Miami, we broke right. his leg. And uh, and so he was going to transfer because Switzer wanted, uh, you know, the little quarterback to run fast, you know, Jamil Holloway. Holloway. And so I called Troy and I'm trying to get him to come to Miami. Well, his father lived in California, so he went to UCLA. So when it came time to draft him, there wasn't any question. He was going to turn me down this time. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your trip to work with lots of laughs. Thanks to Defo and Luby. Now on the Defo Show. Of course, the uh, classic radio laugh that you heard there was uh, that of the lovely and talented Leslie Visser, who uh, still in action, man. I pick up my New York Post today, and I'm reading it on the throne, and, and I open up to uh, one of the full-page ads in the sports section, and who is hosting this big uh, you know, dinner uh, affair, uh, and I guess it's kind of not really an awards thing, but a fundraiser, in New York City on October 24th, but the lovely and talented Leslie Visser. Nice. So, so nice. very much a, a part of the scene. All right, welcome back to the show. We have the Pigskin Playbook going, uh, a.k.a. Dateline Dolphins, with John Congemi, who, uh, I mean, you must have really – that that had to be a killer for a lot of the guys at the uh, high school reunion to see uh, the kind of shape and, you know, physical appearance that, that you generate here today, John Congemi, when, you know, they're walking. How many walkers were there? Anybody have one of the ones with the tennis balls on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, no walkers. Deep. 40 years. I mean, it's a long time to be out of high school. Uh, that's all, for sure. All my friends that really know me, they said, just go ahead. Don't don't touch his head, though, because you might get some black stuff on your hand. <laughs> I said, come on, guys, you guys are killing me. It's all natural, my friend. All, all natural. natural. I, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I can't uh, tell you uh, what was more exciting for me on uh, Saturday. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the Tennessee thing. Uh, beating Alabama, that, that was sensational. Any loss for Nick Saban, and, and huh? where especially, yes. How about the Qs? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was good, man. That, that's a decent team, NC State. Not not necessarily yeah. a winning not team, but no. Yeah. But they had the Carrier Dome, or not the Carrier Dome, whatever it's called now. The Dome. It was yeah. rocking. They had it, you know, pretty much sold out. And that's a tough environment to play in when it's like that. And that's a good football team. That's a hard nosed football team. I I like the Qs. How do you feel about coaches in pregame uh, and halftime speeches? Uh, were, were you paying attention as Dino uh, Babers? Uh, apparently is like the master of, uh, pregame, uh, motivational speeches or, or among them. Uh, and, and a lot of, I, I actually saw him delivering one. Uh, they had, uh, you know, videoed and, and were showing on one of the pregame shows might've been college game day, but, but how did you feel? I mean, I, I, I never really listened to any of that stuff. Uh, you know, when, when the coach was trying to fire up a team, I was more concerned about whether or not uh, the effects of the uh, joint that I had smoked on the bus uh, was going <laughs> to wear off by the time I got the call to come into a game. <laughs> Do I need another one? Now you got to bring in the left. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know what? It all it all depends on uh, the respect level you have for the coach and if it resonates. You know, yeah. if, if this coach is kind of beating the same drum over and over and over and you're kind of looking at your buddy going, all right, it's up to us because this guy. Yeah, we got to go to war. Anybody, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> but if, if that guy resonates with you and you and you kind of trust him, you, you have the passion for him, you love him, you love the message, I, I think sometimes that, that can help, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, there were a bunch of things too. I mean, uh, it was great. I, I, I root against Notre Dame in every ball game uh, with, with every emotional fiber that I can muster up uh, in, in my uh, you know entire being, and to see them lose outright to Stanford while uh, getting uh, Stanford was getting sixteen and a hook on the road. Wow. Against Notre Dame. Uh, I, now I'm rooting. This is an oddity. I mean, you you talk about being uh, you know confused and conflicted. Because I I like the coach I, I would I would root for his success but uh, he's going to go down in Jerry Faustian like terms if this uh, yeah. trend continues with Notre Dame no yes I agree with that and, and Notre Dame sh- should be better Notre <laughs> Dame should be better I mean yeah. come on they're traveling the country they can pick the litter of who they really want to go there and it just seems like anything they've tried you want to talk about giving a pregame or a halftime speech that's not resonating yeah with, with any of the players. I would Notre Dame just looks like they're going through the motions. They could bring in the Pope and his team. Uh, looks like uh, <laughs> you know that that was before horrible. the game, the white that. smoke should be coming from the locker room, and then they run <laughs> out. You know, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, what do you do with that with Marcus Freeman? Because Napier and Cristobal are in year one in our Florida schools, but again, both of those were programs that fired coaches that had issues that were struggling. Notre Dame wasn't. They were. I guess they just missed the playoffs last year, but. They are either in the playoffs or one of the top ten teams every year. Kelly chose to leave for SEC <laughs> money. Freeman was our and he was already on the staff, and people right. wanted him there. And I thought it was an interesting hire because it was like he was only there one year. Like they, he was like beloved, but it was one year. He's been horrible to me. Like as a coach, he hasn't been good. But Notre Dame faithful are really behind him. What do you do with a first year coach that's much like Venables at Oklahoma that was in really good place? And he sort of botched it a little bit. Like, what do you do with the first-year guy? Was that a program that was supposed to succeed? Some people are meant to be head coaches, and some people are meant to be defensive and offensive coordinators. Some people are meant to be position coaches. And sometimes you screw up, and you have to admit that before it gets further along the line. Now, he may end up being a a great head coach for Notre Dame. I don't know if he's going to get the chance. I, I don't know if he gets the opportunity to prove himself. You know, he proved himself as a coordinator. I think he was at Cincinnati. He, he was, was a couple other Cincinnati. places. Yeah. I remember interviewing him at Cincinnati when I was still doing college football games. The guy had his stuff together. He was, you know, gave you great in- insight, gave you good information on his players. So now he's the head coach, and I don't know. He's he's got he's at a, a school where all the resources aren't a problem. You know, all, all the players that you would want to have, they're probably waiting. You know, Notre Dame's on their list. If they're going to go to Alabama and you know, they're going to go to Oklahoma, they're going to go to USC, they're going to go, you know, somewhere else. And, and Notre Dame's got to be on that list. Right. I, I don't know. So I, it's a little bit too early, but all signs are indicating that this, the ship's going down and it's going down pretty quickly. If you're losing to Stanford and you're a 16 and a wow. half point favorite at home, um, at, yeah, home at home, you know, wow. and, you, and you've already lost to Marshall. You, you've already, yes. you know, eaten, you know taken that, that pill at home. Yeah. yeah, there was another game they probably should have lost. Yeah. So it, it's uh, it's tenuous right now to say the least. And I, I just think the rest of this schedule will determine his tenure. I think or at Notre Dame as a head coach. My friend Francesco, <laughs> whose uh, action I book uh, is of course from Tuscany, uh, born in Italy, raised there, and uh, lived there uh, much of his uh, early life. You know, into his twenties, I guess. Uh, a giant Notre Dame fan, so he always takes Notre Dame. So I, I, I'm, you know, inclined to take any team, uh, you know, that, that I've been stuck with in this uh, proposition that we have uh, and bet them on the money line. So uh, 16 and a half was, was a rather generous number on that one. Now, uh, any number of wildly entertaining and meaningful games, though, on the uh, college uh, slate, John Kajemi. You'll come back and talk about some more. Uh, many of our wise guy friends uh, thought that USC getting points was a Ooh, very that valuable was a play. Bad finish, huh? Yeah, yeah. This this coach from Utah, man, he, he was getting, I mean, he was absolutely getting hosed on calls uh, throughout that ball game. And I, I don't know why. I mean, it was like John Robinson back on the sidelines where, where nobody wanted anything to go wrong for USC, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, this Lincoln Riley obviously had, had provided a spark that even was faster generating than, than most that, that would have anticipated having been there undefeated. And they still, I mean, that, that took some balls to go for two there, did it not? Yeah, it did. 
in that spot because really there was time left in the game. Uh, you know, you, you would think you would just take the tie and see what played out the rest of the way, you know, rather than be on the short end of the stick. But it worked, man. Quarterback dropped the middle and uh, boom. I used to uh, root for USC when, when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. I still do. And and I, I, I don't now that they, they NIL'd that pit receiver and they took him for like three mil, you know, four oh, yeah. million dollars. And, <laughs> and then they took yeah. the quarterback from Oklahoma and then they took their head coach. It's like, come on, man, this is college. It's, college football is not college football. It's semi-pro. Yep. You know, it used to be great. I mean, Hollywood really yeah. embraces uh, that USC program. It, it's got a lot of Hollywood in it. And uh, when I was covering the team, they were at the tail end of uh, what was just an absolutely brilliant run of dominance where yeah. every high school player from uh, California that was worth anything, if he even had like seen a star, yeah, whether he was rated or not, that's where he was going. They, they had first dips on virtually everybody. And Dick Vermeil, who could cry on a dime, was uh, sent packing every time he went on a recruiting <laughs> visit saying, uh, you know, hey, we almost got there. him. We almost the got him. Yeah, yeah. No, they had a remarkable run of our running backs there. Charles White was the guy when I was covering Number the team. 12. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ricky Bell uh, also uh, was uh, running the football there. Paul McDonald, great left-handed quarterback. Talk about a game manager. You remember that guy, Paul that McDonald? That was when John USC? McKay was head coach, right? Yeah, McKay and yeah, then John yeah, Robinson. Yeah. yeah, Robinson was a first-class gentleman. I remember All right, we're coming back with more with uh, John Kajemi. The Big Show. Mayo, I mean, he's on board there for the Italian fisherman, I believe. You know what's great, John? No matter what, no matter how much of a sourpuss a guy could be when it comes to, like, your suggestion, you know, of a food item that uh, he's going to like, no one could come away disappointed with this thing. No. Not even a guy yeah. that, that had Not an original Mayo. bias against you. Yeah, I don't Mayo. know Mayo's taste. I don't know where, where his strike zone is, you know, in terms of what he likes. He likes pizza. Skyline Chili. You can appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I can appreciate that. If my car broke down in Cincinnati, I might not go to Skyline Chili. No. I, I really, Unless you I, wanted I to know. change your oil. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you would go to the Big Chill. That's for I sure. would go to the Big Chill for anything on the menu. That's for sure. All right. We'll get oh. Mayo down there and uh, see what happens. If he makes a face, John, you're entitled. I mean, you're not inclined to acts of violence. <laughs> <laughs> but if he gives it one of those... I don't know yeah. about this. I'm going to put him right, right in the, the golf. Put him over the table. Right off the table. <laughs> we'll put him on a runaway wave runner, right? To point him to one of those uh, islands out there. Off, off you, the, want, uh, you want scenic the views here? Just go go south. There you go. Exactly. Right. Right. Uh, everybody loves it down there. Jimmy Johnson's big chill. And uh, we'll, we'll be down there shortly. It's a shame, man. I, I wish you had just caught up with Tommy Fox. I'm going to have to get on him again this week. All right. Uh, back with more with John Kajemi in, in a moment. Now that. The time. It's 8.51. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, <laughs> no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day, everything, and I mean everything is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. He followed in the footsteps of the great Dan Marino and brought Pittsburgh to heights not seen since the great Tony Dorsett ran the ball to Panthers glory. He made the CFL fans forget about Flutie and Theismann and Warren Moon. As a football analyst, he's been compared with Dero and Madden. And even more importantly, he survived the Joe Philbin era as a member of the broadcast team, the Finsiders. We welcome to the program uh, the great John Kinjemi. Made a uh, dynamite debut, as alluded to in the opening there, and uh, came right back with a strong follow-up. 
And every Monday, 9 o'clock, we go Dateline Dolphins with John Congemi. Jonathan, how are you, my friend? I am doing terrific, Defoe. I think the most impressive thing about that open was me surviving the Philbin era. (laughs) (laughs) The only way to get your morning started is with Defoe, joined by Luby, right here on the Defoe Show. Oh, always one of my favorite responses uh, ever here that uh, we've ex- extracted here on a show. I don't know if an extraction that would be the appropriate way to look at it. It sounds like we're pulling wisdom teeth. But uh, no, I mean, just off the top there, the Philbin era. I mean, uh, I mean oh, we'll always go down as a classic period of time in Dolphin history, in, in the Dolphins' uh, long and uh, mostly glorious legacy. Although of late, I mean, uh, it's getting a little bit dicey. All right, John Kajemi with us. We want to take you back to your ESPN roots I don't know if you were ever involved in any of those uh, debate shows, but uh, a couple of quick takes, if you don't mind, because there's so much ground to cover here. And uh, we'll we'll get your feelings about a variety of different things. Uh, All right. uh, The the Michigan thing, uh, they beat Penn State. So uh, are you more inclined to believe, John Kajemi, that uh, Michigan was underappreciated for their wins over those cupcakes or that Penn State was overinflated? for uh, what they had uh, done so far this season going into the Michigan game where they get shellacked in the second half at the big house. I don't think Michigan got enough credit. I I think Penn State's a pretty good football team, and they showed it, you know, a couple games on the road they could have lost easily, and they end up finding a way to win. They go to the big house, and they get run out. You know, I I just think Michigan had one of those days where Penn State didn't have enough answers. So I I think Michigan is a better football team than, than people are giving them credit for. Uh, All right. Um, Is uh, the UM coaching staff off the hook for uh, grinding out or hanging on uh, desperately to uh, beat Virginia Tech uh, 20 to 14? Is uh, Mario Cristobal entitled to a free pass for for a week or so? Uh, No, I don't think so. I I think the pressure is still on. I I mean, they beat a bad Virginia Tech team uh, on the road, you know, tough place to play Lane Stadium. But I think the pressure is still on. You know, if, if Miami is supposed to be what Miami wants to be, they don't just hang on 20 to 14 there. How, how will the uh, college football playoff committee find a way to get Alabama, if they're still outside of the top four, <laughs> into the top four to make the playoffs? They're going to have another vote in a couple of weeks, expanding to eight and then 12. <laughs> and Alabama Whatever. Will, will vault up to probably fifth or sixth and then fourth or third. And no, just, they're, they're going to be there. Alabama is going to run the table. They'll beat, you know, they'll probably have to face Georgia, uh, I would think, in the SEC championship if, if both teams, you know, get there. And it'll, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. All right, it's kind of nice. I, I would imagine they expand it to whatever level Alabama is ranked at. Like if they're ranked seventh, they'll they include eight seven teams, teams in yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. No, no eight. Just wherever Alabama is, uh, that, that's uh, where they'll find a way to uh, draw the line. Uh, all right, uh, and, and on the pro side, are the Jets to be believed? The New York Jets. Better, but not to be believed. I okay. Think. New York Giants are off to believe a remarkable it. five and one start. How are about that? Play? That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the big stories in the NFL, how, you know, a team that was probably going to be a two, three win team is now on a roll and a presence in, in the NFC. It, that's an awesome story. Well, what's with the Packers? I, well, before we go, what's with the Packers? Is it like they lose them onto Adams so now they're not good? Like, I don't, they're a disaster. It almost looks like Aaron Rodgers sometimes feels like he just like throws he's his hands out. up, you know, he's yeah. kind of like, I can go through the motions and kind of give them what I, you know, give this type of, of effort because no one else cares. I'm getting my butt kicked. I got nobody to throw to. It's kind of like a woe, woes me. I don't deserve this as an elite quarterback. You know, you guys screwed up for getting rid of uh, my receiving core. I, I don't know. I don't get the dynamic. I haven't, I haven't watched it enough, but that's the vibe I get. As soon as I turn on a Packer game and I see Aaron Rodgers, I feel like, he, he, it's like, I don't uh, forget, whatever. I'll just, I'm out here. I'll play, you know, they're paying me. I don't know. Is that just the vibe I get? Could you ever have imagined singing the praises of Bailey Zappi before the season started? <laughs> is it Zapp? I mean, is it Zappa? Zappi, what is it? Zappi. 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 Western Kentucky. Should, should the Patriots start him over Mac Jones when <laughs> Mac Jones is healthy? <laughs> Their, their numbers, I mean, are, are, are much better. Roll. The kid, I mean, they've done it once before this way. Yeah. Although the although 
It's the guy Bledsoe. that was there and Bledsoe had a lot of pedigree, a lot more pedigree than Mac Jones. Mac Jones, yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's going to be interesting. If they keep winning, I, I'm not. I'm not changing much. But will uh, uh, Tom Brady regret losing Giselle over this uh, year's Tampa Bay Buccaneers? <laughs> I don't know, Depot. That's a tough one, man. Yeah. Not, <laughs> building a house in Indian Creek for 30 milskis. I mean, come on. There's a lot to know. divide there. I mean, the house yeah. uh, is uh, alone. That would be more than enough for most people to uh, consider. But uh, they've already, uh, I guess, hired attorneys, which is always the biggest waste of time and money, I, I would think. <laughs> you know, is there not enough there to satisfy both people it just that goes. they need to uh, invest like $20 million in attorney's fees J yeah, just to divide their uh, assets? Wow. Yeah. Bobby Kraft, I mean, what do you think about him marrying a 47-year-old woman at 81? Hey, man, if you if you can do it, go ahead. I think that's great. <laughs> what drugs could he possibly be on to be satisfied with this woman at 81? It must be the shoes. I, I think exactly. it must be the shoes. Like Jordan. He would have to have a dowel rod transplanted into the penal <laughs> area. Right? Yeah. Just a big stick of wood there. I, I don't know how he's doing it, man. Well, I guess he's got a lot of wood when it comes to Gelt, uh, you know, because he certainly. Uh, but she's no slouch. I think she's a doctor. No. So that was weird. You, you know what, though? It's within the parameters of my own guidelines where, you know, you take your range, divide it in half and add seven years. And that should be the youngest. That's the strike category. zone. Yeah, he's right in the, the, the bottom. So, you know, he's just uh, slightly out. I mean, we give him the benefit of the doubt. Two ninety nine. The sliding grade is sliding scale of Defoe. He's in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, people were, you know, kind of, you know, taken back. Well, oh, my God, how much younger is this woman? But she, she's in the ballpark uh, when it comes to the mathematical formula. Uh, all right, Johnny, uh, you have a great week. Um, you any, guys do uh, the same. Who's playing tonight? Uh, we got the Chargers going against somebody, right? Uh, I don't even know who's playing tonight's tonight. ball game. Uh, let's see. I got it right here. Chargers and the Broncos. Oh, and that's uh, Broncos in, Broncos in Los Angeles. <laughs> Broncos again. Broncos again. <laughs> Russell Wilson was what? supposed to be good that badly. <laughs> they should, there should be a law in Colorado that they're not allowed to play after 4 o'clock. <laughs> what, what decision are we going to disagree with from the Denver Broncos sidelines exactly. tonight? Can, can Russell Wilson continue? There, there's our final quick take. Can he continue to be, I mean, this appallingly bad as a quarterback? And, and does this look like or not loom? I mean, there have been a lot of giant mistakes made on personnel in sports history. That this would, with the money involved and the, uh, you know, the value of the trade, uh, the number of assets that they had to give away, this might be one of the all-time stinkers. No, I think so. It ranks right up there. I mean, Denver, I thought would be a pretty good football team. You add Russell Wilson. It looks like Russell Wilson. I mean, Geno Smith turned into what Russell Wilson, yeah, it was in Seattle, and now Russell Wilson got the, you know, the the stink bomb of what played quarterback in Denver for all those years after, after John Elway and after Peyton left. It's funny too, because Pete Carroll will always be remembered for the Marshawn Lynch decision and the Malcolm uh, Butler interception there to cost him a Super Bowl. But th this guy's got to be a decent coach. I mean, th this was supposed to be uh, like an absolute garbage year for Seattle. And Geno Smith certainly would be somebody that immediately drew like uh, the usual mocking laughter when you said he's your starting quarterback, and, and yet they're sitting there at three and three, yeah. like like half a dozen teams. Unbelievable. Yeah, more like a dozen teams uh, in the league. Yeah. All right, John, uh, you have a great week. Always a pleasure, my friend. Yeah, Tremendous thanks, job there on the uh, quick takes as well. Appreciate, Appreciate that. It. And it had to be like just embarrassing for the other men that were at the high school reunion. Uh, you know, I, I know you're happily married, but I mean, uh, how, how did the ladies look? I'm going Joe you know Rose what? on you now. How did the ladies look? <laughs> Everybody, actually, you know what? There wasn't a whole lot of people that I didn't recognize right away, which is a oh a yeah, good oh thing, that's, that's a good thing, yeah. which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, I was I was twelve you... beers deep, but I'm saying there's a lot of people I, I recognize right away. But you're wondering if you walked into uh, is this St. Thomas? Uh... <laughs> Looks like the Pinecrest crowd to me. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> we'll thanks, John. Next Always a pleasure, thanks, my friend. Guys. We'll see you next week. John right. and Jimmy, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, join us later on if you're in uh, South Florida. 12 p.m. And uh, especially around the Galt Ocean Mile area, 12 o'clock. Michael Luby Lubitz will be set up for uh, what should be a birthday celebration show. I, I hope I hope Mayo understands what's going on here today. As, uh, he, he's expecting what? Like dancing girls, the Dolphin cheerleaders know. to come out, strippers. He's, All kinds I've, of naked women running game. around on a beach. I don't think no, it's going to be that crazy. I, I'm just hoping uh, Frankie got the message to, you know, put on a couple of the dishes there from the kitchen. <laughs> so I don't have to spring for it myself. 
which, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind, but uh, what, what do we need? Like a pizza, a burger? What, what do you think? The, the pizzas are good, well, and they had some Sandwiches appetizers. are great. Yeah, he yeah. Used to have the yeah. fish, what's it, not fish sticks, but like um, grouper fingers fish or dip. something that were really good. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they have a lot of good food there. It's, they had a lot really of good stuff. The teak was great. Like, yeah. Uh, we had a lot of good times at the teak. <laughs> Always good. All right. Well, we'll be out there later on today, and uh, that'll be Mike Mayo's Lunchbox, 12 o'clock here on South Florida Live. For uh, Brett Tester, John Kajemi did a great job today. Mike Luby Lubitz, the birthday boy. I'm Jeff DeForest. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you tomorrow and then uh, later on uh, on uh, the channel uh, with Mike Mayo at, at 12 o'clock. And uh, until next time, uh, we leave you now that. The time. Not bad for peeling yourself off to Matt Monday. I had a pretty good vibe going here on the show. It's uh, 9.04. Let's go to eat a damn snack. Look what they've done to my soul.